Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 16th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I remind everyone present, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, we have no apologies this morning, so uh, welcome to uh, everyone for coming along. Uh, today we have uh, uh, one item on our agenda. We are continuing our, our inquiry into Scotland's economic uh, future post-2014. Uh, we have two panels of witnesses this morning. I'd like to welcome our first panel. Uh, with us we have the Right Honourable Alistair Darling, MP, who is the chair of the Better Together campaign, and he is joined by Blair McDougall, campaign director. Welcome to you both. Now, we have uh, around 90 minutes uh, for this session, um, so we have some time in hand, but I would remind members, if they would, to keep their questions uh, as short and to the point as possible, and answers as short and to the point would be helpful in getting through the topics in the time available. Uh, and I'm sure you've been following our committee inquiry and you'll be aware of the likely issues that uh, uh, will come up uh, in the course of the session. Um, I wonder if I could just start maybe by asking you, um, Mr Darling, if you could say maybe no more than you know, two or three minutes, why you believe it's in the interests of Scotland's economy that there is a no vote in the referendum in September. Good morning and uh, thank you for inviting us to appear before your committee. Uh, I think the main economic argument for Scotland remaining part of the United Kingdom is the fact that we have access, unimpeded access, to a market of over 60 million people. Now, that's important for Scottish firms, large and small, uh, because uh, we sell more to uh, the rest of the UK than we do to the rest of the world put together. And that, that opportunity, the strength that comes from that, is very, very important uh, because it's uh, these firms that will create the wealth that Scotland will need uh, to look after its people to, um, to ensure that we can enjoy uh, an increasing uh, standard of living. It's also important in terms of jobs, especially at a time like this when we are just emerging from one of the deepest and most profound economic downturns that the world has seen, and certainly this country has seen, uh, that we capitalise on the fact the economy now appears to be growing and that we have uh, those job opportunities uh, that come with that. I think the other thing that I think is important in terms of the security, if you like, that the uh, larger United Kingdom provides for us, uh, it means that in relation to pensions, for example, where in Scotland the po our population is ageing uh, rather more quickly than it is in the UK as a whole, uh, and because of the fact that uh, that burden can be shared uh, amongst a population of over 60 million, that is of immense help to us. And of course, there's also the security that you know, if you're hit by an unexpected shock to the system, as we were six years ago in relation to the banking system, you have that as well. So my view is that at the moment we do have the best of both worlds. We've got this Scottish Parliament responsible for, for many of the things that affect us in our day-to-day -day lives in terms of education, in terms of transport, in terms of uh, uh, health. Uh, but we're also part of something bigger, uh, which benefits us as individual Scots. And I think that is very, very important. And although there are other arguments, emotional arguments uh, uh, that, that are equally important. I think the economic arguments are the ones that drive me and I believe the majority of people to the view that we are better and stronger as part of the UK. Okay, thank, you. thank you for uh, setting the scene uh, briefly and I'm sure a lot of the issues you, you mentioned we'll explore further in, in terms of the questioning. Can, can I just ask one, one follow-up question? You, you mentioned the uh, banking crisis um, uh, six years ago. You were the Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time. Um, what difference do you think it would have made to your position then had, instead of being Chancellor of the UK, you had been the Finance Secretary in an independent Scotland? Well, I suppose the big difference is that we had the firepower to prevent the banking system from collapsing. You know, as I've said on many occasions in the past, on the 7th of October in 2008, I was phoned by the then chairman of RBS, and that morning it had seen a run on the bank, a run on its shares. It was, it, it, its shares had been suspended by the stock exchange twice. And we had a plan ready to go for recapitalising RBS and the other banks, but it wasn't quite ready yet. And when I said to Sir Tom McKillop, um, well, how long can you last? Uh, he said, uh, well, maybe the early afternoon. Um, and at that time, RBS was probably the biggest bank in the world. Its balance sheet was about uh, 1.4 uh, trillion pounds, which is roughly the size of the UK's GDP. 
Now, this is where credibility is important. When we announced the next day that we were going to recapitalise RBS and HBOS and also make money available to other banks as well, people believed that we were big enough to do it uh, because we had that credibility. Now, I contrast that with the, tele the telephone conversation I had with my Irish counterpart at that time, who said to me uh, you know, that the Irish, bank, Irish government had effectively just underwritten the deposits in three Irish banks. And I remember saying to him, but they're much bigger than you are. And he said, well, you know, I hope no one notices. Uh, well, they did notice quite shortly after that. And unfortunately, Ireland, along with Iceland, were brought down by the way to their collapsing banks. Now, I hope we won't get to a situation like that again. But the, you know, the lessons that I drew from that, is, leaving aside how it arose in the first place, is if you want to stop a crisis like that, you have to do more than people expect, and you have to do it more quickly than people expect. Something the Eurozone, for example, has conspicuously fail, fail, failed to do because it doesn't have that firepower available in relation to Greece uh, for, that, for that matter. So the strength that comes from being a larger country, plus the fact on that day the bank, Governor of the Bank of England spoke to the uh, Chairman of the US Fed and, say, and said, please make sure RBS doesn't collapse during the course of that day by making temporary funds available, which had to be repaid, of course. He did that, and he didn't ever ask, well, can you afford to do it? So it, is, it was actually, if we had not been the UK, if we'd just been Scotland, in, in Scot the Scottish GDP in relation to um, RBS would have just brought the whole country down, and it would have been catastrophic. We'd have ended up you know, having to go to the IMF as Ireland's had to do. When you hear people on the other side of this debate saying, but in the event of a bank failure, other countries' governments would, would, would come in and support the banks, I mean, is that a credible response to you? No, it's not. And, you know, I was there at the time, and I don't remember lots of people phoning up saying, can we come and help bail out your banks? What, what ha if you come to the, the, the recapitalisation of, um, of UK banks or any country's banks, that falls very much on the country where the brass plate happens to be. What is available on a temporary basis is the temporary funding, the liquidity funding, as it's, as it's called, you know, to keep a bank going on that day. But central banks can only provide that liquidity if the bank concerned is solvent and a going concern. Now, if I mentioned the US Fed, all they needed to know was we intended to recapitalize our recapitalize rbs overnight so there wasn't a problem in relation to that uh, but you know i've you know, i've read elsewhere that people said oh but the americans paid well they didn't they did no more than we did uh, and you know banks in london access the bank of england special liquidity scheme but they do it at some cost because they and to use the banking jargon, they take a haircut for doing it. Uh, and it's, it's quite an expensive thing to do. Uh, but the actual capitalisation, uh, which, you know, RPS had nearly £50 billion, that came from the UK taxpayer, and that is presently to be found as part of the debt we presently have at the moment. So I'm afraid there was no one clamouring to recapitalise these banks. That's the argument in Europe just now, because they don't have a proper banking union, and there's this big argument. Germany is saying, why should we put money into southern Mediterranean, uh, southern uh, Mediterranean countries, banks, and so on. If you can't do that, you lead to inherent instability, which is why you know people you know are a bit concerned about you know the state of the eurozone at the moment because they don't have that sort of efficient system uh, that you obviously have as a sovereign state. Check for his follow-up. Uh, very interesting point. Uh, good morning, by the way. Hello. Uh, you said that, that there's not a credible thought that, that, that the problem falls very much on the country where the plaque happens to be. Who bailed out Barclays Bank? Well, the didn't go to any government. They raised money mainly in the Gulf. And you know, I go back to, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question for you to ask. In the, the scheme that we put in place on the 8th of October 2008 was that the, firstly, the FSA, which was then the regulator, had to assess for each bank how much capital they needed. And if they needed more capital, the first place to go was to the private market. And if they couldn't access the private market, then the government would provide it. So if you take HSBC, for example, it didn't read, need very much at all and raised it itself. Barclays decided as a matter of principle they would not take money from the British government for various reasons. Uh, so, sorry, the bailed out by the Qatari and the American governments, well, no, which, they, which they, flies they, in the face of what you're saying, no, that the no, that, that's responsibility not falls very much on the country where the plaque no, that's, that's not quite true. They, they raised money 
um, in the Gulf from what were sovereign wealth funds, but it was it was not you know the Qatari government per se, although you know the, the, obviously their wealth funds are heavily influenced by these governments. But and equally, the money that they raised from America didn't come from you know uh, the U.S. government as such. It came from American institutions. Uh, so you know the, the, it, it, it's 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 quite different from the situation with RBS and HBOS or Lloyd's HBOS as it was, it was about to, to become, um, simply because they had to come to the UK government because nobody else would lend them money because bluntly they were bust. Barclays was not bust; it was solvent and was able to raise money in any way that any other financial institution or any other company can do that at the same time. I suppose we can all put a different slide on um, I, I should say to Blair McDougall, if you want to come in at any point, just catch my eye. L like you, this is probably, you know, like me, this is probably above your pay grade, but, you know, it's, it certainly feels above my pay grade, these discussions. Yes, thank you. Right, I'll bring in uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, I, I don't think I'm probably even a lower pay grade than Murdo, but I don't know. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I'll maybe come back to some of the, your opening remarks in a second, eh, Mr. Darling, but first of all, um, the, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has said that uh, uh, those supporting yes will always be able to come up with examples of um, small, independent, successful economic countries, you know, that sort of thing, like, you know, Finland, Switzerland, Norway. And then he was saying that, you know, of course Scotland can be a successful, independent country. Do you agree with David Cameron? I don't think size determines your economic success. Uh, you agree with David Cameron in saying that Scotland can be a successful, independent well, country. Well, he didn't use small. Well, I, but I think in, your, in your, your preamble to your question, you were talking about large and, and small companies, countries. And you know, I, I've, my position is quite clear. I mean, it's not, it's not your size that determines what you do. Clearly, if you are a smaller country, uh, the evidence tends to suggest you have to run a tighter fiscal policy than otherwise, um, that you might otherwise do. And if you look at uh, you know, countries like Denmark, for example, they have higher tax rates than we do. Um, they actually, they, 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 as a matter of policy, they, they, they shadow the euro. Uh, I think it's in relation to Scotland, it, as, long as, you're, as long as you're prepared to cut your cloth according to your means, and as long as you understand there may be things you can't do, as, what, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm answering the question my way rather than, rather than you know, uh, well, well, well it, it, it is, but I, and, you know, I hope my answer is relatively simple as well. Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've never taken the position that somehow you can't do it. What I have said, if you do do it, then you can do it, but you need to be straightforward about the consequences about what that means in terms of your tax and spend policy, in terms of uh, what uh, what risks you can take on and what you can't do. So, um, you know, I, I, it's not. I, I've never. I don't think size isn't the issue. It's actually how you run your country, if you like, and you know, I suppose in this day and age, how you're perceived to run your country in terms of you know credit risk and so on. You, you've got caveats in terms of what David Cameron said, that of course Scotland can be uh, an in, a successful independent country. Any, any country can be successful, and as I say, size doesn't matter. However, I mean, if you if we take, you know, let's get on to the point in relation to Scotland, whereas you know, in the last 20 years and every year bar one, Scotland has been running um, a, a deficit. Now, if it, if, it, if it became independent, it would clearly have to do something about that. And you, you'll be aware of the IFS report that was published last November, uh, which pointed out that we have, as I said earlier, um, a you know, rising uh, uh, ageing population. We have a relatively falling uh, working age population. Uh, they've made the point in order to meet, in order to reduce the deficit that Scotland would inherit as part of any settlement, uh, but in order to make sure that you'd, you, you, you were running uh, a fiscal policy that was credible, there would have to be some changes. Now, you know, if, if that is a position that you, you take as a matter of principle, which I assume you do, that's fine as long as you tell people what the consequences of that are. In the white paper in itself, Scotland's future, and basically uh, it's set out, you know, the, the aims of what a Scottish government would, would be taking forward. Um, a couple of points that you made in terms of the, uh, you know, exports, etc. Um, you, you will be aware that, you know, in terms of um, what's happening within Scotland at the moment, we're, we're actually punching well above our weight in some respects. And there was some, some question as to whether investment might dry up in Scotland if we were to go ahead with a referendum. You, you are aware that Scotland has had one of the most successful years in terms of investment coming into Scotland. 
Look, firstly, I mean, you know, I'm sure you and I will disagree about whether or not we accept um, uh, the white paper published last November as being the gospel or not. I mean, there are some things in there that I think are open to dispute. In relation to investment, um, what I would say is that, uh, firstly, um, Scotland, yes, we have done well. Uh, for some time, we've you know, indeed the whole of the UK has been one of the world's. Um, uh, it has been the number one destination for foreign di di direct investment for some considerable time, and Scotland has benefited from that. Where the the problem would arise in relation to investment is firstly in relation to any uncertainty. Uh, arising from a yes vote in September in relation to what our arrangements were in relation to currency, in relation to debt, in relation to uh, you know, how we allocate responsibility for pensions, our membership of the European Union. Wherever you've got uncertainty, as I think you know, members of the committee will accept... What, what we, could I... right, Mr Darling, uh, people that are investing in Scotland at the moment are well aware that there's a referendum. They've been aware that there's going to be a referendum for some time and they're still investing. But no, that, 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 that wasn't the point that I was making. I said if there was a yes vote and consequences naturally follow from that because if that happened then independence uh, would be inevitable rather than There was going to be a no vote or no, a yes vote. They, no, they've invested regardless, surely. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm, you were asking me about uncertainty and I was saying that the uncertainty that we would be likely to hit investment is that in the event of a yes vote you would get a whole range of uncertainties. Now, as I say, as I say um, you know, you know, as a matter of principle, um, you believe in an independent Scotland. Uh, but you, yeah, I, well, I, I got that one right. Um, um, however, we were, we were already. Well, well, yes, and you know, for the sake of completeness, I don't. So there you are. Um, but in relation, in relation to when you've got uncertainty and you've got risks, you've got costs, and you know, you, that, that, that's that's where I think that, that it would be damaging in the longer term. Uh, in relation to investment, it would all depend upon, as I say, fundamental questions like what currency we would be using, our membership of the European Union, the terms and conditions, and so on. To my, my, my original point, uh, Mr. Darling, and uh, uh, please, I mean, what I'm saying is, are you suggesting that all these companies that have been investing in Scotland, record investment in Scotland at the moment, are 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 doing so? thinking that, you know, they, they, they invest for 5, 10, 15 years ahead. They're, they're not just investing for tomorrow or for the, the outcome of a referendum, the 18th of September. They're investing because they know that Scotland is going to be a successful economic, perhaps independent country. Nobody knows because we don't know the outcome of this referendum. I'm saying they've, they've invested regardless. They, 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 they have been investing... What, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat everything I said about where I think the uncertainty comes in, but I'd also make the point they have been investing in Scotland for the last few years, knowing that Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, that if you invest in, Scot in Scotland or a Scottish firm, that firm has got unimpeded access to sell to the, a market of 60 million as opposed to 5 million, and they know exactly the terms and conditions in which the UK is a member of the European Union. What I'm saying to you is that if Scotland were to vote to become independent uh, in September of this year, then many of those certain Uncertainties will become uncertainties, and that's where your risk to investment comes in. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. okay, Mr. Right. Thank you. Very much. Okay, I'll come back. Richard Baker. Thank you. I can highlight my uh, declaration of interest as a member of the board of Better Together. Mr. Stein, my um, questions around financial regulation. We've taken a great deal of evidence over the course uh, of this inquiry on the issue of financial regulation. Of course, a separate Scotland would have to establish its own. Uh, financial regulator. Uh, what challenges do you think this would bring uh, if um, uh, Scotland was in that situation with its own regulator? Uh, and also, um, not just looking forward but looking back, some people have said that if Scotland had its own financial regulation prior to the banking crisis, it simply would never have happened in a separate Scotland. And I wondered if you had any views on that. Well, firstly, in relation to setting up your own regulatory regime, uh, I suppose the, the obvious challenge is setting up something that's brand new in an environment that is still pretty turbulent. You also have a major challenge where you have a financial sector that is about 12 times the size of um, Scotland's GDP. Uh, and that, I think, would be a formidable challenge 
uh, you'd also, the, the, one of the big decisions you'd have to reach is what, to what extent would the, decision, would the regime here be different to the rest of the UK? Now, obviously, given the relative size of the sector to Scotland, you might, for example, to say, have to say that banks need to hold more capital uh, than otherwise. That affects you know, their, their ability to lend. Uh, you might well want to have a different regime. Indeed, I know that you've taken evidence, and there have been many people who have given evidence in various um, uh, uh, committees and other hearings as well, who've made the point that the regime might well have to be, you know, rather more tight, if you like, uh, than than it is south of the border. So, you know, um, I think that would be one of the biggest challenges. One of the other things is that at the moment, the UK is one of the world's um, leading regulators, whether it's the FSA or now under the auspices of the Bank of England. Uh, and that does give us a lot of influence. Um, if you look, the, the main regulators are largely the Americans, ourselves, um, the Europeans, or it's rather fragmented at the moment, um, because they, they have in the past um, been hugely influential on in what the overall regime looks like. That matters to Scotland because one of our strengths in Scotland is our finance. We are, I think, the fourth or fifth biggest financial centre in Europe, but actually we are one of the few. Um, uh, financial centres outside the really big ones that in addition to banking, uh, pensions and insurance, we've got a lot of asset uh, management and so on. So it's actually very, very important for us what the regime looks like. Where it would directly bear on Scotland is um, how would it affect a firm based here like Standard Life, which sells about 90% of what it does to south of the border, where you'd have a different regulatory regime, therefore there would be a cost in trading across the border. What would it mean in terms of asset management and banking and so on? So, yeah, there'd be, you know, nothing in this life is impossible, but there would be additional costs, of uncertainty, and also, um, I suspect, it would knock into negotiations with the European Union. In relation to um, uh, what would have happened if we'd been a Scottish regulator, well, you know, it's very difficult to say. Um, although, um, you know, I, I do know that um, uh, the First Minister writing in the Times just uh, before the 2007 election, they came across this quote which, in which he said um, that we are pledge, pledging a light touch regulation suitable to a Scottish financial sector with its outstanding reputation for probity. Now, that was 2007. Let me say now before the rest of you get stuck in, there were many mistakes made in relation to the regulatory system in the UK, in America, in Europe, you name it because too often the regulators were simply accepted the word of the banks they were regulating and other institutions that everything was okay. Um, however, as I've said on many occasions, yes, regulators, and therefore the government's responsible, must shoulder their share of the blame, but the primary responsibility for the conduct of any firm is uh, the board of directors. And unfortunately, the decisions that led to the collapse of RBS were made by RBS here in Edinburgh, as they were in HBOS, unfortunately, made here in Edinburgh. Both these banks were brought to their knees and have collapsed uh, because of bad decisions. And, uh, you know, I think it's really, if you look at what was being said at the time in 2007, when light touch, which incidentally is a term I've never advocated, it was being used all over the place by all the political parties at the time, uh, and uh, we were paying a very heavy price for it. We all accept the need to tighter financial regulation, but what you said at the, um, the beginning of your question, and that would be particularly stringent in the context of a new financial regulator in Scotland with a very big financial services sector. So is your argument that would actually make a situation uh, of access to lending even more difficult in Scotland, where many businesses say it's, it's already very difficult for them to get access to lending which they need? It, it, it's true that the more capital a bank has to hold, um, the less cap capital it's got for lending. Now, so, uh, it, it, don't misunderstand me. We've got to make sure our banks are much better capitalised than they were. I mean, RBS in 2008 was running on today's equivalent of about it had 2% capital, whereas it ought to have been you know, between 10 and 12%, uh, which is why it was so vulnerable when, when, when it bought ABN, which you know, led to eventually brought the thing crashing down. And obviously, that, that, that does have an impact. It will have an impact across the UK as a whole because you know, people are now seeing banks having to more, hold more capital. The other thing is that I, mean, I don't think, you know, if Scotland was independent, there is no way uh, that we would not have to run a pretty strict regime because you couldn't peril the entire country on the possible folly of, you know, a financial sector that was 12 times bigger than you were. And look what happened to Ireland or Iceland. They were completely, you know, uh, done over by the fact they, they did not have proper control over their financial institutions. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, it, we would have to run a, a far more tight regime. Uh, the other thing, you know, it's one of the, the things that when, um, when, people, when most of these institutions raise money internationally, particularly in the United States, people will increasingly look, and I suspect this will be true for the next 100 years or so, on not just who are you if we're going to lend you money, but who stands behind you? Who is your central bank? And what's the central bank worth? And the central bank, frankly, is worth only as much as, uh, as the country. The Bank of England doesn't have very much money of its own. It's really just routine stuff. All the support that was given to the Bank of England, uh, through the Bank of England, either um, through capital or through support, every one of it has a letter signed by me uh, guaranteeing the Bank of England every last penny that it spent. Uh, and that's why it's the creditworthiness of the government that actually very often determines the creditworthiness of an institution. So, yeah, it would, it would have to be much, much tougher, I think. Uh, but, um, and, you know, obviously, the more costs you add in the regulatory regime, the less money there is to be going elsewhere. And finally, on the issue of the, the, the Bank of England being Scotland's lender of last resort, potentially, uh, and the proposal for a currency union, uh, many of people have questioned the wisdom of that approach which the Scottish Government has brought forward, not least... Uh, the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman has made the very points you've made about the size of Scotland's financial sector compared to the rest of its uh, economy. And, of course, even people in, yes, Scotland have questioned the wisdom uh, of that proposal. But is it your view that on this proposal for the currency union, the sterling zone, uh, that it's simply not politically acceptable to the rest of the UK or not on their interests? Or do you think it's something which actually wouldn't be in, in Scotland's interests either uh, if we were to be a separate nation? Well, that's a big question. I'll, I'll try and uh, do what Mr. Fraser asked and give you a succinct as possible answer. The first thing to keep in the front of your mind is that when we talk about the Bank of England being the lender of last resort, which technically it is, uh, it is actually the government that is the lender of last resort. Because whether it was Northern Rock, RBS, or any of the other banks, the special liquidity scheme, or the various other schemes the bank operated, the, the lender of last resort was the UK government. And similarly, if, if you look at, uh, so, you know, you know, if you look at America at the moment, uh, the U.S. Fed is the lender of last resort, but it's actually Uncle Sam. It's the, it's the, the U.S. government that people look at. Um, so it is not, would not be up to the Bank of England to say yay or nay to such a proposal, but it would be up uh, to um, the, the government that stood behind the, 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 the Bank of England as to whether it would do this or not. I, I think the way that I look at a currency union is it, I look at it from the, the e economics of the thing. I mean, you can't ignore the politics because politics enter into most, most things in life. And, you know, I look at it from, from Scotland's point of view. Um, uh, I, you know, even, even if one was on offer, which it isn't, you would be in a position where, uh, if you, in order to guarantee a currency union, you'd really have to sign up to anything that the, your other partner and then its enterprise was insisting upon. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a deal. And, you know, as someone who is Scottish, I, and, you know, if there was an independence vote, I would be disturbed if the country in which I then lived was in a situation where it basically had, signed up, it had to sign up to a whole bunch of conditions on tax, spending, borrowing, undertakings not to compete on tax or whatever else they might throw into the works. I think that would be very bad for Scotland. Equally, as, uh, from the rest of the UK's point of view, a, a currency union only works if you've got... A, substantial degree of economic um, uh, cooperation. You need, as Mark Carney said earlier this year, to have the ability to transfer funds from the better off parts to the, the poorer parts. He said maybe 25% of GDP. And critically, you need a banking union. And what you'd be saying to the rest of the UK is you've got to underwrite uh, uh, you know, both countries, in theory, underwrite both sets of banks, but it's a very asymmetrical relationship, simply because of the size of the Scottish financial sector. Now, I think for those economic reasons, the whole thing doesn't stack up. Now, you do, there is the political overlay, because if you, you know, I think, you know, if the country, two countries were to break apart, you know, there would be, politics would enter into it, just like politics enters into every aspect of life. But it's the economic test that I think it fails, which is why I don't think it would work. Uh, Mr McKenzie has got a follow-up on this question. Uh, good morning, Mr Darling. Hello. Don't you find, don't you feel a tiny bit of shame coming to Scotland and lecturing us about banking? You were the Chancellor who allowed the banking crisis to happen. It happened on your watch. Don't you feel that you owe an apology to the people of Scotland and indeed the UK? The first point, I live in Scotland. It's my home. My family's been brought up here. So I'm not coming to Scotland, as you put it. 
Uh, you know, it's really, it's, 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 uh, you, you, I understand the sincerity which you hold your views, but please also understand that there are some of us on the other side of the argument who are equally sincere in what we're doing. Now, in relation to the point you made about the banks, as I said uh, in reply to uh, the point raised by Mr Baker, um, I was Chancellor at the time. I was a member of the government for 13, the Labour government for 13 years. And of course, I accept responsibility for everything that we did or didn't do during the course of that time. I've said also to you that I think the regulatory regime at that time uh, was found wanting, uh, although I have to say, you know, the, the clamour for light touch regulation was one that was advocated by every party your own one included. And don't, don't you think there's a deep irony um, that you of all people should lecture the people of Scotland about banking? Firstly, I'm simply answering the questions that you and your colleagues are putting to me. Uh, a lot of it turns on what happened at, at, uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to be judged on what I did or didn't do at that time. Uh, and what I, my concern now, if you like, as we look forward, is that firstly we don't repeat the mistakes that were made at that, last, at that time. And, you know, as I say to you, you know, I'll accept my responsibility, but, you know, also the leader of your party was advocating light-touch regulation at the time. Heavens, he even wrote to RBS, uh, Fred Goodwin, you remember him, um, uh, commending him on his takeover of ABN AMRO, uh, which was proved to be absolutely calamitous at that time. So all politicians make mistakes, um, but in relation to this particular problem, what I'm seeking to point out is that moving forward, if Scotland had a financial services sector of the size that it has, then there are consequences so far as the regulatory regime uh, are concerned, and we just have to accept those consequences. As I say, you and your colleagues would say, well, we want independence, uh, therefore we, we accept those consequences, but for goodness sake, we need to tell people what those consequences are, and don't sort of pretend they don't exist. Uh, very briefly, Mr Darling, uh, just, I was interested in your answer to Mr Baker. Um, didn't you previously say that it was a logical thing to do, to enter into a currency union? What, what you will find from your party's various press releases, the use of two words uh, which were um, separated by a number of paragraphs. Uh, and it's, it's, it's never a great thing to do, and I know all political parties do this from time to time. What, uh, rather than um, take up too much of the committee's time doing this, what I suggest you do is read my entire reply to Gordon Brewer on Newsnight Scotland, which I think was in January, the beginning of 2013. Nobody listening to that could have been in the slightest doubt uh, that what I was advocating was what we have at the moment, which is a currency union, and it works because you've got a political and economic union and a banking union that stands behind it. I was making the point at some length about the difference difficulty you've got with the currency union where you've got an asymmetric relationship where you've got one very large partner and one you know, much smaller one and the terms and conditions which I thought would be objectionable to nationalists, never mind anybody else. Uh, so, but do read the whole thing. I know I'm not, often I would commend any answers I give to uh, someone on a late night uh, programme, but if you're going to look at it, you will then be able to see where the word logical and desirable uh, appeared, but you find they, don't, they do not appear together. Right, um, Alison Johnson. Good morning. Um, better together, and, and you yourself suggested this morning that there are benefits for us all as individual Scots in remaining part of a, a larger UK, but it certainly doesn't feel like that for far too many people. The areas of multi, multiple deprivation that in Edinburgh, and I, I'm Edinburgh born and bred, they remain markedly and disappointingly unchanged under the current regime. Now, clearly, too many Scots aren't seeing the benefits, and that's despite the fact that the Times Rich list have reported that they've never seen such fast growth at, at the top end. But what about all those people that we continue to let down at the bottom end? Um, there's no written submission from Better Together this morning, and I just wondered what you have to offer. What, what guarantee is there that under the current UK settlement we're going to see change for those people who've been ignored for far too long? Because evidence would lead me to believe that they're not, it's not being given enough attention. These people are constantly being failed by Westminster policies. Okay. Where I disagree with you is that th what determines um, uh, action in relation to either alleviate poverty or disadvantage or better still to stop it in the first place, is the political actions of the government of the day, whether it's in Edinburgh or whether it's in London. It's not the constitution that determines that. Where I think you and I would disagree is that having 
access to being part of something bigger, having a bigger economy, better equips you, if you're willing to take the political decision, to alleviate poverty. And if I look at what happened uh, in the 13 years where we were in government, we, in the UK as a whole, we took a million children out of poverty. Uh, but um, in relation to children, the poverty, uh, children living in absolute poverty fell from 28% to 12% during that, uh, that uh, period. In relative poverty, it fell from 28% to 12%. So that is because the government of the day took a decision that it would do increased child benefit, uh, through uh, child care provision, um, through other uh, the tax credits, um, all of which the present government takes a rather different view of that because it's, it's quite hostile to a lot of these things. But that is an action of where you can reduce uh, uh, child poverty. Now, in addition to that, if you want, to, that, that's, that's, that's by alleviating the symptoms, if you like. In addition to that, surely what is important is making sure that you stop it arising in the first place. And that means, for example, educational attain, uh, improving educational attainment. That's why I, for example, wouldn't have cut over 100,000 college places in Scotland, a decision taken here, not taken in London. Um, and and if, you look, if you look at health, which is another determinant of uh, poverty, you know, you, 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 you know, I noticed last week, um, I think a Scottish minister was comparing the health comes in Glasgow and Harrow. Well, why not compare the health comes in the east end of Glasgow and Lindsay, eight, ten miles away? which you will find there's a 10-year difference in life expectancy. Now, I mention education and health because they are totally devolved at the moment. And it is up to the government of the day, whatever government happens to be in the Scottish Parliament, to decide what it's going to do. So it's not the constitution that determines these things. It is the political decisions taken by the administration, wherever it happens to be. The constitution clearly has a part to play. Thankfully, some issues are devolved and they're allowing the Scottish Parliament to mitigate the worst impacts of welfare reform. But we're having to spend money that we could spend on other things to address the bedroom tax, for example. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, I believe, have suggested that the gains that we've made, the improvements that we've made to children's lives, will be lost if things continue as they are. And the constitutional settlement is key, because who's to say that after May's election next year we're not going to have a conservative UKIP coalition? You know, there are no guarantees under the current system. In any political system you've got, there's always choices that are going to have to be made. And, you know, as, as I say, if you look at Scotland's overall position, we, unfortunately, have had a, a deficit in every year bar one of the last 20. So you'd have to do something about that. You can't just, you, you can't, you can't just live with that. And, and, and if you look at the decisions that the Scottish Government have taken in relation to college places, it has a choice as to whether it does that or whether it continues to give um, free prescriptions to everybody. These, the, the, uh, you, know, you can argue for as long as you want as to which choices it makes, but the idea under any constitutional settlement, anywhere in the world for that matter, that you aren't at some stage confronted with difficult decisions is, I just disagree with you on that. I'm not here to defend the Scottish Government's position on college places. It's one that I disagree with, but I still don't feel I've had a response to my question. Things haven't changed in our peripheral housing schemes for decades. What are Better Together going to do about that? Better Get Together, you know, narrow point, is not a political party. We're fighting the referendum. Um, you know, the, the, that's, it's, of what, Better Together offer. What, in, 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 relation to, in relation to housing, I agree with you that Scotland has for a long, long time uh, had a situation where we've had far too many uh, houses that are not up to the standard we, we'd want. And in addition to that, we haven't been building as many houses as, as we'd want. But I say, that is, that is a political decision uh, by successive governments, and just the decisions that the Scottish Government has taken, they're entitled to take them. But it, it isn't the Constitution that determines these things. Two things determine it. One is how much money you've got to spend in the first place. And, you know, I said what I had to say about the, the economy uh, and our economic prospects earlier on, which I think is very important. As someone who will be living in Scotland, regardless of the result, I would be very concerned if, we're in a, if the IFS is right. In six or seven years' time, we're faced with a situation where we're having to make greater cuts or increasing uh, taxation simply to, you know, to, to keep going, which means you would not have the money to do the things that I, perhaps you and I would agree with. But the second thing you need to do is have the political will to tackle these things. Sometimes we do have the political will. You're hamstrung and prevented from doing so. If you look at Westminster's policy on, on renewables, for example, we're not seeing the investment that Scotland needs. Instead, we're seeing a government who's determinedly investing in nuclear power stations. Um, and you know, a recent report from, from several, from five experts, have pointed out that actually 
electricity would be cheaper in an independent Scotland because the UK is going to be paying for the Hinkley Point reactor for some 30 years or more? Well, I think, again, you and I might disagree on this. And I, think, I think we all benefit from having a mix of energy provision. I know you, your party doesn't uh, believe that. And as you know, Scotland, a lot of Scotland's base load electricity comes from two nuclear power stations at the moment, um, the future of which, you know, we're... We've yet to hear what's going to happen to them. In relation to renewables, I just make the point that the renewable energy industry, and particularly in Scotland, benefits from the fact that the subsidy comes effectively from all UK consumers because we all pay into that. I know that because I, I set it up. Uh, and it's, um, it, it, it's one that's very beneficial to Scotland because, as you know, we've got more investment here proportionately than you know, the, the population would suggest. And if you actually lost the UK energy market, that would be very damaging to the renewables industry, industry in Scotland. Agree to differ. Could I ask one more question? Um, yeah, uh, one point that you have, have made um, time and time again is about pensions and, and how secure they will be if we remain part of the UK. Now, ICAS currently estimate a £300 billion private pension deficit, um, which isn't exactly prudential management by the UK. Stirling University have shown that the extra costs in Scotland can be offset by levels of immigration that have been the norm for the last decade. Do you not agree that an independent Scotland, a wealthy country, an independent Scotland, can create a system to provide well for people in their old age? Well, there's three things that I'm going to ask Blair to say something, since otherwise you'll be wondering why he's been here, um, in, in relation to pensions. Firstly, in relation to the state pension, uh, as you know, the state pension isn't funded. It's paid as a pay-as-you-go basis. And uh, you are right that the IFS and others have said that given the fact we've got a, an ageing population and our working-age population is falling relative to that, um, you either correct that by you know, making people pay more tax to fund the thing, because that's actually what pays it, or you increase the level of migration. Um, however, I am unaware of the Scottish Government or anyone else on that side of the argument actually saying how much more immigration you would need. Um, but you are right that the only way, if you don't, if you can't replace your working age population through, you know, increasing the birth rate, you have to do it through migration. And if you don't do that, you have the problem that Japan's got at the moment, where they have very little migration, they've got an ageing population, they've got debt of 200% of their GDP. So that, that, that's, that, by all means, come back. But let me, let me just answer the other two points. On the other ICAS point, was in relation to funded pensions, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the occupational pensions. Um, for many years now, too many of these pensions have not been properly funded, or at the moment you've got a situation where they are UK-wide. Under EU law, if Scotland became independent, these pensions would split, and you've got to make sure that both sides are funded. Now, the only people who can make sure they're funded are either the pension members through increased contributions or reduced uh, drawings out, or I suppose if the Scottish Government felt it had enough cash around to do that, it would have to top them up. So, you know, I, I think that those are both issues uh, that, 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 that certainly concern me, both in our, in our ability to fund the state pension and to increase it, because that's, I think, what most people would want. In addition to that, you've also got the problem in relation to funded pensions, where you, you're taking on a whole bunch of risks and expenditure which you don't need at the moment, because we don't have to fund them separately. Sorry, I, you were going to come back. Yeah have the case in Ireland where there was a transition period. I, th I think this is perfectly possible, but the immigration issue is key. And again, I'd come back to the point that if next May we see a Conservative UKIP coalition elected, surely that is a greater threat to the stability of Scots pensions than anything else, maybe. Well, I won't surprise you to know I'm not enthusiastic about a Conservative or a UKIP, let alone a coalition, uh, some coalition, um, uh, since you kept seem to have difficulty working with themselves, never mind with working with anybody else. Um, but in, in, in relation to pensions, you know, one of the things about pensions, as we all know, is they span several governments by their very nature. Whatever government introduces a reform, it's several governments on before you know whether it worked or not. Um, but I think in, in relation to the immigration point that you, you, you rightly put, if you've got a falling working age population and a rising retired population, as I say, there's only two ways you can get the money. It either comes out of something else you'd otherwise be doing, or you try and encourage more migration. Now, if that is your policy, like so much else, that's a policy decision you're entitled to take, but you better be upfront about it, because people would like to know. If you're part of a, you know, a larger UK that has a, 
an immigration policy that doesn't match your country's needs. That's a real challenge. And, 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 and there are consequences too. If you have two different immigration policies across a landless border, you know, at some point, I suspect, an obvious issue is going to arise. But an independent, independent Scotland needing to boost its working age population by X, because I don't know what the number is, and it might be useful to know what that number is between now and the 18th September. If you are going to increase immigration to fill that gap, that is a policy decision that the Scottish Government is entitled to make, but so far it has been very coy on A, the fact it's going to do that, and B, if it is going to do it, I mean, how many people are we talking about? Because it has a knock-on effect on housing, on schools, on health, and so on. So can, can I... Yeah, that point, I, yeah I, I, I mean, I think Alice has, has covered most of the points I would make. Just on this point of immigration, um, with the Scottish popu ageing population, you've got over 65s um, set to grow significantly over the coming decades in Scotland, and you've got the working age population actually set to shrink in comparison to that, whereas with the rest of the UK, you've got all sections of the population, broadly speaking, set to, set, set to grow. Um, and so the question about what immigration policy uh, we need uh, from the pensions point of view arises from um, the decision of independence. Um, and so the question then is, as Alistair says, if the affordability of pensions is predicated on um, interventions in uh, the population through immigration, then you've got to question whether that is actually a credible uh, policy. Now, two independent um, research, uh, uh, researchers have now put a figure of one million immigrants um, on that um, in order to make pensions affordable at the, ra at the rate of uh, equivalent to the UK. Um, the, U the Scottish Government, to the best of my knowledge, has not put a figure on that, so it's very difficult to judge whether the promise to make pensions affordable um, through immigration is actually a credible one or not. And I think until we see what the Scottish Government's figure is, it's difficult to tell whether pensions are actually safe or not within an independent Scotland. Okay. No, you ask a question. I just wanted before, I'd like to talk about forecasting, but b before I do that, I wonder if you might explain uh, why, in your answer to Dennis Robertson uh, about uh, foreign direct investment, up until 2008, Scotland uh, had about 8% of the UK jobs that came from foreign direct investment. In 2010, it ro rose to 19%. In 2011, it was 20%. In 2012, it was 18%. And the latest uh, forecast for 2013 is 20%. To what do you attribute that dramatic change in direct investment towards Scotland as opposed to the rest of the UK? It's a benefit, I seem to remember, from those figures that came out last year. Um, so, it, 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 as I said, Scotland benefits uh, to a very large extent, not just because of what we offer in Scotland, but we're part of the United Kingdom, part of a bigger market. In the same ways, we benefit hugely from overseas uh, uh, investment. It, it, hold on, let me finish. All right. I, I was going to just add the point that you know, we, we, get, we have a lot of investment for example, in the, uh, in the motor industry that is that's here purely and simply because we're also part of the European Union. Uh, people like getting into a market where they not only get into that immediate market, but they also get into a bigger market as well. It has a big benefit. I recall Scotland was part of the UK before 2008 uh, as well, so you, you really haven't explained the difference. But anyway, let, let me get on to, to forecasting. In 2010, the Financial Times, you said, right, you're talking about the OBR, he said, right from the start, the Tories used the OBR not just as part of the government, but as part of the Conservative Party. And in fact, if you look at the, the first chairman of the OBR was Sir Alan Budd, who was a, a, an advisor to Mrs Thatcher. Uh, and if we look at the constituency of the existing board, you might have been right. Have you changed your view? I do remember that. That was, the, if I remember rightly, that was the first OBR report that was published about three weeks after the general election, prior to uh, George Osborne's first budget. Uh, and I remember there was a fuss at the time, and I remember discussing it with Alan Budd at the time, uh, who said that you know, think matters hadn't been handled um, in the way that, that uh, were perhaps uh, ideal. Uh, since then, uh, the OBR has uh, um, uh, moved on. Uh, Robert Choate, who currently uh, chairs it, I think is doing an excellent job. Uh, and I think, you know, 
there's a there's a broader point um, here in relation to forecasting, um, because I dare say you'll come on to this. Forecasting at a time of economic crisis is incredibly difficult because there are some, so many un, un, uh, uh, unknown things uh, that are happening. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at the time that I was forecasting an extremely turbulent period, you know, in 2008 my forecasts were in line broadly with others. But by the end of 2008, it was quite clear that the world had changed dramatically. Equally, if you take the OBR, uh, the forecasting that is done post 2010. Uh, as you know, things were considerably worse in the first two years than people anticipated. We're now in the situation where they're saying, and so is the Bank of England, think things are getting better. So it, it is a difficult thing to do anyway. But I do remember the point, there was a particular point, I think just after the general election in 2010, where I think there was a general feeling that the OBR had gone off to a bad start. But that has been put behind them. So I think this is a case of where the facts have changed. And when the facts change, uh, I do change my mind. Perhaps that, I should acknowledge it was I'm somebody sure. else who said that originally. That, that's very welcome. Thank you for that. Uh, but we are, as you say, you say, we're in better times. So if I look at the economic fiscal outlook for Scottish tax forecasts for the OBR, I have a statement here that says, and you say they've improved, we are therefore not able to produce a Scottish macroeconomic forecast to drive the Scottish tax forecast because of the methodology. We consider these methodologies work in progress. So why are we putting so much emphasis on the OBR when they haven't established a meaningful methodology, which they themselves say is work in progress? Well, look, the OBR, first of all, um, is there to do forecasts for the whole of the UK, and it operates off the data that, 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 that we have. Um, what what, it, what it, it, it hasn't done, and what's more difficult to do, is to disaggregate um, the tax take from the different, different parts of the UK. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to do it for income tax, but it's much more difficult, even with corporation tax, it's not always clear where the money has been made, and for indirect taxations it's more difficult still. So the OBR's job, it wasn't actually set up to do that sort of studying, um, but as you know, people like the IFS, who do have a record on this, have been, and other people too, uh, the National Institute and so on, they have done quite a lot of work, work on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as you know, forecasting tax take is, like forecasting, you know, growth and everything, is uh, never going to be an exact science. Uh, what it can do is give you pointers as to the sort of um, environment you're likely to be operating in. Sorry, a big question. Um, I mean, I think, I think your, your first question was about um, the politicisation of forecasts, and your, your second question, I guess, was about the, maybe illustrated the point about the need to be, to be cautious <coughs> with things. Um, the Scottish Government, in its forecasting, uh, published by uh, John Swinney, for oil projections going forward, took five scenarios from scenario one, which was the most pessimistic for oil revenues coming out of the North Sea, to scenario five, which was the most optimistic. For the year 2012-2013, um, even scenario one, the most uh, optimistic, uh, most pessimistic scenario um, of how much uh, oil revenue would flow out of the North Sea, was out by about one billion uh, uh, pounds. So I think it, I think it reinforces the, the, your, your initial point about the need not to be too political um, with forecasting, because the problem with those oil forecasts is that they are the underpinning for the sole page of economic forecasting, which is within the white paper on page 75. So it's already been shown to be to be uh, op too optimistic. The government is depressing the forecasts for oil and revenue. I'll come to that in a minute. This was real tax take that, that, that has been proven um, to be uh, uh, out of uh, kilter with the, the forecast that was made. Go on. Uh, well, I, I was going to say that uh, it is also regrettable. The OBR, in its own statement, says, due to the confidentiality of the measures, the methodologies they're using, we were unable to involve the Scottish Government uh, on the, in this stage of the process. So I'll leave it there. Can I? One of the other things that we have heard a lot of is businesses will move from Scotland uh, in the event of referendum. I have here a Herald's newspaper the day after your budget, Mr. Darling, in 2010. And one of the headlines is large companies may ask why stay in the UK. And they're talking about the, the relocation because of corporation tax. Uh, and making various comments about moving their headquarters. Why do we have so much scaremongering? I mean, we understand uncertainty when things change, and those of us that have run businesses understand that uncertainty. But why are we having so much emphasis on this when, in fact, there's a very select few uh, and individuals within organisations who are talking about they might not stay in Scotland? Your own evidence suggests, or the evidence of your budget in 2010, suggests exactly the same situation was happening. 
I think we make two, two, two observations to you. Um, la for larger organisations, um, they do over probably not immediate reaction, but in a longer time scale, they do make choices about the jurisdictions in which they operate, whether it's the regulatory regime, the tax regime, uh, what's it like as a place of do doing business. Um, so, you know, it, 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 is, it is influential and you can't ignore it, particularly in a world where you're, it's a very globalised economy and people are not just choosing between Scotland and England, but they're choosing the Far East or Europe or South America or anything, uh, or some, uh, some, somewhere like that. But in relation to um, the companies that themselves, I mean, I'll give you, you know, two examples. Standard Life, and it was them that said it, not me, and, you know, Standard Life didn't, you know, discuss it with us before they, they, they made the point. What they're saying is they compete with other big insurance uh, pension companies uh, based south of the border. Uh, they said not that they would move everything, but they might have to move uh, some of their operations south of the border if they were faced with a different tax regime or regulatory regime. And as you will know, the pensions industry is largely driven by the tax and the, the, the pensions regime. Or if you take a smaller company, that, which I, I met uh, in Port Glasgow, that, that makes um, uh, me mechanical pumps, where most of its customers are south of the border, most of the component parts come from south of the border, and the guy that owns it was just making the point, he's having to deal with you know, two separate regimes for a tax and accounting and so on, and he said, it would make a difference to me, and I don't think I could carry on doing it. Now, obviously, each firm, each individual, will have a different view as to how it affects them. What we the population as a whole of Scotland have to decide is, you know, on the balance of probabilities, what's likely to be best for an economic environment where you have a thriving business sector that employs people, that pays its taxes, that contributes to the wealth of the country. And you will understand which side of the argument I'm on as far as that's concerned, though I quite understand that you're firmly on the other one. And I, I hear what you say, but if I look at the, the list of companies at that time, we're talking about Diageo, Guinness, uh, uh, Diageo, Unilever, uh, HSBC, and who in fact actually moved. Uh, I think you know it's time we started being realistic and stop uh, a lot of the uh, uh, scaremongering that goes on in that situation. Oh. One last question, if I may. You made a, a, a comment about our first, my first minister, talking uh, and supporting the Royal Bank of Scotland, Fred Goodwin. In your autobiography, on page 62, you indicate that Mr. Goodwin. Uh, came to you on December 23rd, I believe, with a panettone. Um, and he told you then that there was, a, there was a problem with the liquidity of the banks. Why didn't you do something about it immediately? Well, firstly, thank you for the plug for my book, which is still available from, <laughs> still available from all good booksellers. And, and I, I hope you got me on page 62 and you weren't just standing in W.H. Smith uh, looking at it. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, Fred Goodwin did come to my house on the... Uh, December of uh, uh, 2007, I think it was. Um, and what he was talking about, he, he, was, he had two concerns. One is he was concerned about the lack of liquidity in the system, uh, which is something the Bank of England actually addressed a very short time after that, because they, you may remember, that in a coordinated action, they, the bank, uh, the, the US Fed, the Bank of Japan, the uh, Swiss Bank, the, the ECB, um, all said they would have a combined scheme. So they actually, it did provide liquidity. Where I think the problem was that it was always the view of RBS, or certainly Fred Goodwin's view, that, it, that RBS simply had a cash flow problem. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it, it, it was lack of day-to-day -day money, which they certainly had. But what he did not accept at that stage, which is also recorded in that uh, chapter, is that I said to him that why does everybody think you've got a capital problem? Now he said he didn't have a capital problem, but the markets at that time think, thought they did, principally because of the takeover of ABN, to which, as you said, um, your first minister was adding his blessing. Uh, because ABN was a basket case, an absolute basket case, and it wasn't the sole thing that brought down RBS because they, they lost money in conventional lending, they lost money spectacularly in relation to some of the trading and derivative instruments, particularly in the United States, which they started in 2006, I think. Um, but the long and the short of it was this was a once great bank, one of the biggest banks, if not the biggest bank in the world, brought to its knees. And I come back to the point that Mr. Fraser made it the first time, at least it is, the RBS is still here. It still employs a lot of people in this city. And it's only did that because I was in a position to be able to do something about it. And, you know, if we'd left, thrown, uh, trusted in uh, Mr. Goodwin on the board of RBS and had, were not in that position, 
a lot more jobs would have gone and the consequences for the Scottish economy, never mind the UK economy, would have been catastrophic. Well, thank you. Just, just, just let me... I wanted to ask you about um, the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, uh, Nicholas McPherson, uh, who raised eyebrows when his ad advice to the Chancellor uh, was published on the same day as uh, George Osborne made the speech uh, emphatically ruling out a currency union. Now, in a Freedom of Information request in November 2012, the Treasury stated that Sir Nicholas met yourself uh, occasionally, uh, socially, from time to time. Uh, when did you and Sir Nicholas last meet? I think I bumped into him in March. And how many times have you met him since the referendum campaign began? Oh, I don't know. Maybe... I don't know. I, I, I don't want to give you an inaccurate advantage. Just, just, say, just say one thing, Ms McAlpine. Yeah, I do, obviously, I worked very closely with Nick McPherson for three years, and previously when I was Chief Secretary of the Treasury in the late 1990s. For the sake of completeness, I also keep up with a number of other permanent secretaries in the departments that I've worked, including other civil servants. It's not abnormal. The one thing I'd make very clear is that every single civil servant that I, that I you know, you know, have contact with are absolutely scrupulous about not discussing what they advise the current government. And that's one of the strengths of the civil service in this country. So I wouldn't read too much into the fact that, yes, I know Nick McPherson, and I saw him nearly every day of my life for three years uh, during some quite interesting times. So have you discussed aspects of the independence referendum with him? All the, all the, uh, in terms of Better Together, in terms of um, uh, uh, the contact uh, we have with the UK government, that's done through political channels, not through the civil service. I asked if you had discussed aspects of the independence referendum with your friend Nicholas McPherson. Well, yeah, I discussed many things. I'm not going to go into private conversations, but in terms of the... What, what I, as I said to you, I'm not going to go into private discussions I have with him or anybody else for that matter, but what I can tell you is in relation to whatever advice he happened to give to uh, the current government, I've not discussed that, no. Well, I'm asking what he said to you. Did you discuss aspects of the independence referendum with your friend Nick McPherson? I'm not going to discuss private conversations uh, any more than I would discuss a private conversation I have with anybody. Did you, did you discuss the currency union with Nick McPherson? I I, I can't really add to what I've said, Ms McAlpine. But what I can say to you is that what the advice that Nick McPherson and his colleagues give to uh, the current Chancellor and Chief Secretary is advice, advice that I'm not aware of. It's something, if we have contact with the government, we do it through political channels, not through the civil service. I was asking about your conversations with your friend, Nick McPherson. But we'll move on to... You understand that, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I can move on to a report in The Guardian uh, by the Chief Political Correspondent Nicholas Waugh on the 29th of the 3rd this year. It quoted a Treasury source as saying, Alistair and Andrew are running the show. We just did what they said. They were referring to Andrew Dunlop, the PM Special Advisor for Scotland, who also advised Margaret Thatcher and yourself. Uh, can I ask when you and Mr Dunlop first ruled out a currency union, discussed ruling out a currency union? Didn't. And, you know, it's news to me that I'm running the show so far as the Treasury was concerned. I mean, I did, uh, but I don't know. Well, I, I think it's a matter of fact that I don't, quotes run the show. Of course I've discussed with um, Ed Bowles, George Osborne, Danny Alexander, a, a currency union. It would be extraordinary if I hadn't done so. Uh, and you may recall, you know, you want to know what, where people were thinking about these things. When George Osborne, I think, first spoke on the subject, it was last summer, uh, when he said what he said, you know, his, his own words, his own thoughts, when he said he thought it would be very difficult. This is prior to him then saying, actually, he wouldn't do it. And it would be extraordinary, too, I think, if I hadn't discussed with Ed Bowles, who's a shadow chancellor, a member of my own party, if I hadn't discussed him, the merits of these things, and for the sake of completeness, I've also discussed it with Danny Alexander. So, but, you know, it won't surprise you to know that on that particular issue, in relation to currency, we have a common view. Ed Balls, because Ed Balls, um, when he appeared on Ian Dale's LBC radio show on the 12th of February 2012, which was the day before George Osborne made a speech about currency, he, he revealed he hadn't read the Treasury paper uh, that day, uh, but he, of course, immediately came out uh, to back up George Osborne the next day. As a member of the, the Labour Party, very senior member, did, did the Labour Party carry out their own analysis before ruling out a currency union, or did they just adopt George Osborne's analysis? No, 
you may recall that um, uh, Ed Bowles, when he was a special advisor in the Treasury, uh, was very largely in, in, uh, instrumental in determining what was the then government's policy response to the euro. So he is well versed with the problems that are associated with the currency union. And indeed, you may recall, since you seem to be reading quite a lot of clippings from the press and so on, that when he came up, I think it was during the Dunfermline by-election, and again uh, in, uh, at the end of last year, um, on both occasions, he expressed extreme skepticism about currency union. So I don't think, uh, and, and you know, the government, government papers are published by the government, so Ed wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't have seen them. But he was, the idea was coming fresh to this. Is not, it's just not right. I mean, he has got a lot of experience. This was a coordinated, staged, managed event in which he was wheeled out to support the Chancellor. Can I ask you, is it the usual practice for the Labour Party to follow the policy of a Tory Chancellor without scrutiny? Uh, you know, in relation to a, a currency union and the currency, what would happen you know, post-independence, it's surely not surprising that the principal finance spokesman for all three parties would have looked at this matter and taken a view on it. And yet, you know, the, the view was universal, that the economics don't add up. Now, the actual production, the preparation of the Treasury paper that you refer, that's obviously a matter for the UK government, because that's what governments do. Uh, but the fact that, you know, they have a common view shouldn't surprise anyone. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, although the process is fascinating to some, um, I would have thought what's more interesting is the actual substance of a currency union, which, as I said in reply to earlier questions, I think would be bad for Scotland. Never mind the rest of the UK. I just ask um, Mr. Yeah, Mr. McDougall, but Better Together published a dossier um, immediately after uh, Osborne's announcement claiming that the currency union wasn't possible. Had you been told what the UK government was announcing? In a matter of days before it happened, yes. So you had discussions with the UK government on the announcement of the Chancellor? As, as I told you, through the political... So I'm asking Mr McDougall. Well, he, he, he can answer as well, but I'm just... Yeah, no, I, I'm asking Mr McDougall. Right, He's just on, admit, on. admitted that Better Together had had discussions with the UK government before not, Mr Osborne's speech. Not, not, not about whether the decision should be made, but about that the decision was coming. Thank you. Um, Margaret McDougall. Thank you and good morning, panel. Um, throughout this inquiry, we've heard uh, from different uh, witnesses that taxation and uh, the welfare state would be uh, much better if we were independent. And could you perhaps tell us your view on what the levels of income tax would be? Because really, what, we, what the people that we're talking to when we're out and about, uh, they're worried about how much it's going to cost them personally. So, and we've heard from, as I said, various witnesses that tax levels, income tax levels, are likely to be higher if this asp aspiration by um, the Yes campaign and uh, the SNP would um, lead to welfare benefits, for example, being more akin to the Nordic states. Well, I suppose this comes, it comes back to the, the point I made right at the very start, that if you look at you know, tax and welfare, if you are part of um, you know, something bigger than the United Kingdom as a whole, uh, you have about 31 million taxpayers uh, over which you, uh, and as well as, as, in addition to that, as business uh, taxpayers as well, over which you can spread the burden of the money you need to raise to pay for pensions, the welfare state, health, education, and so on. Scotland has a a taxable population of, I think, about two and a half million people. So it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot smaller. Now, if you look at the, um, you know, what's often said about the Nordic states, you know, people have said, well, we can have what they have. You can, as long as you also accept the taxes that go with it. Uh, that in all those um, states is higher than ours, typically 25%. The top rate of tax is higher than we pay at the moment. Uh, and so, I always say to people, if you want to advocate that Nordic settlement that uh, says there are, you know, in some cases, better public services, they're not everywhere, frankly, uh, but and to go with it, you get the higher taxation, by all means advocate it, but tell people what you're going to do. Because people might vote for it, but they want to know in advance, well, what's it going to cost me? How much more am I going to have to pay in individual taxation and so on? 
I think there's another consideration, again, which I think I adverted to earlier on in relation to the IFS uh, report, which no one seriously challenged. I mean, the IFS is one of the few organisations I'm aware of that possibly because it's very good and possibly because every political party at one stage or another, usually in opposition, has endorsed. And it's actually very difficult then to say we don't believe what they say when we're in government. But they've made the point that in about um, five or six years' time, Scotland will have a very big gap between what it spends and what it gets in, which will have to be filled. They estimated at about £6 billion. Now, if it, you have a gap of that size, there are a limited number of um, high-rate taxpayers in Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government has already said it's going to cut corporation tax by three pence. So that means somebody else is going to have to pay, and that somebody else is the rest, you know, the ordinary people who are going to have to pay um, either an income tax or increase VAT. Now, VAT at this, in this country at the moment is now 20%. I think people would be very, very concerned if it went up to 25%, um, because, you know, that, that, would, that would be a big hit. Uh, but so I, I just think that you can look at any country you want and make your comparisons, but the thing to remember, you know, I'm sure everybody appreciates that, there's no country in the world where everything's perfect. They've all got their problems. Uh, you know, Sweden's got big social problems. Uh, you know, um, so have some of the other Nordic countries. Um, uh, but if you, if you advocate higher taxation, as it is open to anyone to do, then by all means do so, but remember to tell people first. This is, I'm trying to get a figure out of you. I mean, how, what level do you think it would be at in an independent Scotland? Again, it would depend on... You know, I forget, someone asked early, earlier on. It, we're, at the moment, uh, we're running a fiscal deficit. We're spending more than we get in. And, and this year alone, if you look at the latest figures, we lost four and a half billion pounds worth of revenue from the North Sea Oil, which is roughly what we spend in schools in Scotland. That's, that gap would have to be plugged. It would have to be plugged if you were an independent Scotland. You have to plug it now and you have to plug it from somewhere. So the, the amount of money you raise in tax is driven by two things. One is what, do, what are you spending your money on um, you know, in, in terms of your services and also, and also what, how much would you have to spend on servicing debt? Uh, you know, and, and this, it, all the, the, the best estimate I've seen is the IFS one because it has looked at the demographic pressures facing Scotland. It's also looked at the fact that you know, what, you know, whatever is happening in the North Sea Oil, by definition, it's not renewable, and every day there's less than there was the day before. So it's very difficult to put a precise number on it. They put a number on it, £6 billion, which it would, would either come off, either go up, mean increased taxes or reduce spending. And if I can just um, ask another question around if there was an independent Scotland, how difficult would it be to actually set up a separate tax system, given you know, the intricacies of, of where we are just now in the UK, and what would be the cost implications from that? Because I mean, I think we've all seen the ICAS report this week. Um, if you could... Figure of about 750 million, I think. Um, well, I think there's two things. One is the Scottish Government's view is that HMRC presently constituted and on the benefit side, the DWP would continue to pay, uh, pay out benefits and collect taxes for maybe five years, which actually limits the scope to what you can do anyway because certainly the DWP, I know from my own experience, can't operate. It can pay out universal benefits, but it's, it's very bad at chopping and changing. Um, but you would have to replicate these things. And, you know, that's money being spent on you know, a new bureaucracy you don't need. And I would rather see that money spent on some of the things that um, Ms Johnson was saying. It's, I thought I'd switch the thing off. I'm very sorry about that. What? Yes, which, you know, the point that, um, that Alison Johnson was making, if there's £750 million pounds available to spend, I would rather not be spending it on replicating what already exists. Uh, I think the ICAS also made the point that you'd, you know, you'd expect to have less civil servants administering it, and I think they put the figure at 2,500 or something. Uh, but again, if that's what you're going to do, then tell people. Well, yeah, well that's my point, I think, because I think uh, the people in the street want to know just what it's going to cost them. Uh, and OK, it's OK to look at the bigger picture and we talk about the economy and, and what that would mean. But in actual fact, people's most concern is around how it will affect them personally. And I think they're looking at how realistic um, both sides' uh, views are. Um, so if we could just um, perhaps 
in reality, how long would it actually take to ch set up these um, institutions within Scotland, you know, already, post referendum? Yeah. Well, I, I have some experience here in that um, uh, when Job Centre Plus was set up in uh, for the whole of the UK uh, about ten years ago, it took about two or three years to set it up. The more problematic thing is not so much the people, but it's the computer systems that go with it. And uh, we're not the only country, but there's a long history, and an unhappy history it is too, of brand new computers, uh, which uh, when they get unpacked are supposed to do all sorts of things, but then you find they don't actually quite do that. Uh, you'd also remember that in a, when you're doing this, you presumably be changing the tax code at the same time. There's big issues in relation to tax of you know, who's, who's a Scottish taxpayer, who's a UK taxpayer, and so on. And I think these are questions where, to be honest, nobody knows how long it would take, but we are kidding ourselves if you can do these things quickly, because these things always take longer than you think. Uh, and where, you've, where there is delay or uncertainty, you've got costs, you've got risks, uh, you've, you've got um, blight, frankly. And the blight that would come when decisions have yet to be made I remember, the, I mean, I cast who know about the tax system make all sorts of points about VAT and all the rest of it. These are all issues which we could greatly benefit with far more information now rather than find out on the 19th of September that it would have been a good idea if we'd known it all. To the uncertainty and turmoil that um, would follow on from uh, if it was an independent Scotland. Undoubtedly, there'd be uncertainty, and the idea that you could fix all this by March 2016 is for the birds. To start with, I mean, I, my experience in the European Union is that you, nothing that I'm aware of has ever been fixed in 18 months, even when they agree. I mean, maybe, maybe two uh, pertinent sources for, for, for your last two questions. Um, in terms of the, the um, cost of the setting up the tax system, and yesterday, John Swinney was, I think, in the media saying that he believed that um, setting up a tax system could actually save um, Scotland money. Um, in the leaked Cabinet paper of 2012, um, he predicted that the uh, costs of a separate taxation system could be in the region of £625 uh, million pounds, uh, for Scotland, um, which I think is around about £300 million pounds more than the share that we pay in to uh, maintain um, the UK um, tax system. So I'm not quite sure how what, what was written in private quite squares with, with what was said in public yesterday. On the point about the length of time in setting up institutions, um, the uh, Scottish Government's own expert group on welfare in its first report looked at some of these types of issues in terms of setting up uh, uh, systems for the payment of, of, of benefits and pensions. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that their conclusion was that you're looking at um, you know, a period of time around about a decade in terms of getting institutions set up and any attempt to, to move to separate systems before that um, was, I think in their words, a serious threat to the, 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 the continuity of payments uh, for people. And obviously these are the things that would be um, sort of um, uh, rolled into any negotiations after independence. But um, I mean, you're looking at 10 years and you're looking at a lot of cost. Two members to get in before 11 o'clock. Uh, Marco Bianchi. Um, in response to Alison Johnson's questions earlier, you were very keen to, to talk about poverty rather than inequality, uh, Mr Darling. Uh, you also said about the IFS, it's very difficult to say we don't believe what they say, your words. So the Institute of Fiscal Studies report uh, Poverty and Inequality in the UK published in 2011, found that, quote, income inequality rose during the 13 years of Labour government across a range of potential measures. What guarantees do you see for any kind of change in the event of a no vote, given the record of Labour? Again, you know, the, the decision, the, the, the reason in, in, the income inequality rose largely was because of a very rapid increase in the top decile of uh, the population, which is something you see right across the OECD. Uh, and we see it in this country, particularly uh, because in the, the last 20 years, we've had an influx of people who are on the very high income end of income scale. But if you want to do something about that, the question is uh, what, what your top rate of tax is. Now, as you know, I put the top rate of tax up to 50 pence, and the last budget I did um, is now coming back down again. But again, that's a political decision. Equally, in Scotland, if you, if you 
if you wanted to narrow that inequality, and I don't think Scotland's got anything like the, the same number of very high earners, it is open to a Scottish government to say, well, we're going to have a top rate of more than 50 pence if it wants. I just think if you, that's what your intention is, then you should tell people beforehand rather than after. Draw your attention, actually, uh, in going as your very first response to the, the issue about the top going up as the reason for inequality, uh, to the final Prime Minister's questions by Margaret Thatcher, where I believe that was her exact defence, and I assume you were there. But looking at this, for the last 55 years, Scotland has voted Labour in every general election. Do you think that inequality would be higher or lower in Scotland if we had had Labour governments every time we'd voted for them? It, 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 it's it's a really an, an impossible question uh, to answer. What I can say is point to... Equality. Uh, no, I'm not saying that at all. I was about to say that if you look at the Labour government in the, of which I was a member, it did reduce. It, did, it, did, it, it reduced poverty, and it, particularly on people on the lower income uh, levels, we increased uh, income levels. And there's a very good study, if you want to read it, prepared by the LSE, which so it's impartial. Uh, it's, uh, it's not our one. It's done by uh, Professor John Hills and others, in which he goes through, it's a report card, if you like. And actually, yes, there were things that weren't right, but there's a lot of things that were we did get right, and if we were elected again, we'd like to continue doing that. Your test, would 55 years of Labour government, or indeed Scotland getting a Labour government whenever it votes for one, have reduced poverty more than the last 55 years have? Well, it's, it's impossible to say, because you know, some, if you look past, you know, past the... Governments wouldn't have reduced poverty. That it would be an object of any Labour government and every Labour government to reduce poverty. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, that, you know that, that's one of the, the, the central planks of what we stood on in 1997, and we were standing on it next year. So, yeah, yeah, don't misunderstand me. I want to see Labour governments. Um, but, you know, I, I rather got the impression that you were in favour of independence, regardless of whether it was a Labour government or not, because you didn't like us when we were in government any more than you liked the Tories. <laughs> I'm not sure there's any party anywhere in the world who's been in power, certainly a democracy has been in power for 55 years anyway, so it's, a, it's an interesting hypothetical. Um, I mean, for me, and I guess this is where I take my better together hat off and put my, my Labour Party activist hat on, inequality and poverty are tackled through policy decisions made by uh, parties. Um, and what we're looking at now is, is not about a hypothetical past, but what we're being offered um, in the future. Now, um, my party is offering, as Alistair says, 50p um, top rate of tax. Um, uh, tax on the bankers' bonuses in order to guarantee, guarantee, get, guarantee... Here is a better together am, representative, and not to, a representative I'm, I'm, of the I'm Labour about Party. To, if you let me finish, I'm about to segue into the referendum. There are policies being espoused which are redistributive. There is not a single policy within the white paper, which uh, you stand by, which has any redistribution in it. In fact, there is one which is redistributive, but it's redistributive from the poor to the rich to the corporation tax cut. So we can talk about reducing inequality, but there has to be a recognition that there is nothing within um, the white paper that's being um, held up as the, 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 the promise of reduced inequality uh, within Scotland, which is actually redistributive. I disagree over your interpretation of the white paper, obviously, but my, my question remains, what is the offer from the no side to reduce poverty and inequality? Is it to continue voting for the Labour Party, which hasn't worked for the last 55 years? Well, you're criticising Blair about the Labour Party, but your questions appear to be more about the Labour Party than they were about Better Together. And you know, I repeat what I said earlier, Better Together is not standing in the general election next year. You know, our purpose is uh, to fight the, in the referendum campaign. Uh, but I suppose I would come back to the broader point. Our ability to tackle um, inequality, to make sure that we live in a fairer and better society, I think is far better delivered uh, as being part of the UK because of the resource, because of the potential, because of the opportunities, than it would be if we were to break off and go it alone. Now, obviously, we disagree on that, but that's, what, that's my position. Question. You clearly believe there are benefits to being in the union. I, I would disagree with you on that. I think we've had quite a few honest disagreements here. How many years, what proportion of years of Conservative government that Scotland didn't vote for do you think is a price worth paying for what you consider to be the benefits of union? A general point. At the last election, general election, um, the, the Conservative, the more people actually, though I don't 
approved this, voted for the coalition government and voted for the SNP. The Tories were, were the, in the last place, then you, then the Liberals, then us. And, there, and if you look at over the years, uh, there have been times when people you know, in, in England have uh, found that they didn't get the government quotes that they voted for. Um, but you know, I don't think that your argument is a strong one in saying, well, we should break up the UK and everything that goes with it. Now, you and I, well, I don't think we would agree on what sort of government you want to see in May next year, because as I say, I don't think you like the Labour ones either. Um, but I think, I think that the, the potential that we have of being part of the United Kingdom, it means it's far more likely that we would have the ability to deal with the inequalities and the injustices that possibly you and I might agree on. Now, we disagree on the, on the, the way of achieving that, obviously. Okay. Um, Thank you. Convener. Uh, questions are for Mr Darling. Um, you're currently running a poster campaign with uh, the message, more powers for Scotland guaranteed. Now, I'm assuming you're not talking about the powers conferred by the Scotland Act because they'll come into being regardless of the outcome of the referendum. What are these more powers that you're guaranteeing? Yes. And, you know, it, 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 and did, I'm glad you agree that because the last a couple of times I cross cross sword with the nationalists, they were busy asserting the Scotland Act um, wasn't going to come into force, so it hadn't been agreed yet. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just asking yet, what these more what, powers are that you're well, guaranteeing? The, there's the, the taxation powers that come in the 2012 Act, but all, uh, all three uh, non-nationalist parties, if you like, are promising that uh, they will they have additional powers. They're not all the same, something that no doubt they might want to agree between them, but it, 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 it is the case that the additional taxation powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, the power of stamp duty in relation to borrowing, all came under the 2000 Act, and I say these are guaranteed, but there's more beyond that. But, but in terms of, you've talked a lot this morning about, and indeed over the last year or two, about the need for certainty. Don't you think that the you know, the people of Scotland need some certainty from the no campaign and specifically in terms of what those extra powers are that you're guaranteeing if there is a no vote. The Labour Party and the Liberal Party have announced their plans. The Tories, I understand, are going to do so shortly. So before the referendum campaign, you will see what the three of them are offering. Now, it may well be, uh, as presaged the... Scotland Act of 1998, that they will come together and possibly, who knows, for once, there'll be a fourth party there because the fourth party was not there on the other two occasions, either for Kalman or in the Scottish Constitutional Convention. Uh, but it is the case that more powers are guaranteed, not just the ones that are coming through, but also in relation to what the three non-nationalist uh, parties are saying. With regard to the Labour Party offering then, because I'm assuming that you're at least able to speak for that, Reform Scotland's analysis suggests that they offer a further 4% in, in terms of tax raising powers and ability. Um, what, what do you think that 4% is going to do in terms of dealing with the, the, the type of inequality uh, that Marco Biagi and Alison Johnson have talked about? And I'm, I, I, I'm sorry to have heard you attempt to deny that there are these problems in Scotland earlier on. That, what, what, what is it that Better Together can offer the people, the 400% you know, increased people using food banks? What, what is it Better Together can offer people who are experiencing fuel poverty in Scotland's islands at a rate of 50%? What, how do you think that 4% extra powers is going to tackle in any way those problems? Central, but just, just, just since, since you said something... That, when, you, when you said something that, that wasn't quite, quite right, um, at no point have I ever said that Scotland doesn't have huge social and economic problems still to be tackled. Of course it does. I mentioned health inequality. Uh, the fact that if you look at the health outcomes in a large part of Scotland, they compare very badly... Uh, and, and some of them are, 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 are you know, really a disgrace for a country of our status and our maturity. If you look at our life expectancy of some of our citizens, people dying 10 years before their counterparts living in other parts of Scotland, not, other necessar not as well as other parts of the UK. And in relation to our educational attainment, you know, if we do very well by a lot of our pupils, but there's a lot of people still leaving school without um, the qualifications you would expect. So nobody is going to tell me that 
the job is done or even anything like that. The, qu the thing that we've come back to again and again and again is that I don't believe it is the constitutional arrangements that determine uh, people's success or people's life expectancy or well-being. Or, or it is about the political decisions that the government of the day, either here in Edinburgh or in London, take in relation to any of the matters that, that, that you that you referred to. Now, what the Scottish um, the Scottish Labour Party proposals are, it gives the Scottish uh, uh, government will give the Scottish government more power, more responsibility over raising the the money that it spends, which I think is all to the good. But at the end of the day, whatever government is elected in 2016 or in London, Westminster, 2015, um, it is the political decisions they make that will determine many of the things we've been discussing today, not the constitutional arrangements. And, you know, it's almost like if only you change the constitution, then you'll have all the money and everything that you need to do things. It's not like that. Could you... Uh could you please explain to me? Could you please explain to me how those this four percent extra more powers, this tinkering around the edges, will help deal with the problems that we've heard described this morning? I don't know where you get your four percent from. That, that it seems to me that what the Scottish Labour Party was putting forward, plus you look at some of the things the Liberals are putting forward, and we'll wait and see what the Conservatives have got to say. These are additional powers which I think most people will welcome. But what I think people in Scotland want above all else is they want to know what is the best way of achieving the ends we all want to achieve is a competing vision between building on the strengths and opportunities you get from being part of the UK and making our decisions here in Scotland or whether you achieve these things by breaking away. Now, you know which side I'm on that, but I think that is what is like to be foremost in people's minds when they go to the polls in September. Why is that happening? Well, today, that, um, it's been a, a long session. We've covered a lot of ground. I'm very grateful to you both coming along and answering our questions this morning, and we'll have a short suspension to allow a change of Thank you.
Right, um, if we can uh, reconvene, um, I'd like to welcome our second panel. We're joined this morning by uh, Blair Jenkins, who is the, the Chief Executive of Yes Scotland, and Dennis Canavan, who is the Chair of the Yes Scotland Advisory Board. Welcome to you uh, both. Um, uh, we've got about, uh, well, maybe about 90 minutes for this session, but I would remind uh, members that they would to keep their questions short and to the point, and if we could have answers that are equally concise, that would be very helpful, because there's, I dare say, a broad range of issues we want to try and cover in the time uh, that's available to us. Um, I wonder if I could start by asking you a very, a very similar question to, to the first question I put to the, the, the first panel um, earlier this morning. Um, what... Uh, in, in your view, uh, are the advantages to the Scottish economy from a yes vote in the referendum? And you know, if you can maybe try and answer that in sort of you know two to three minutes, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm a convert to the cause of independence, and my conversion is not based on any emotional experience. It's based mainly on my parliamentary experience. I spent 26 years as a member of Parliament at Westminster, followed by eight years here uh, in the Scottish Parliament. I've been retired now for seven years, and that's given me time to think, and I have come to the conclusion that Westminster is increasingly out of touch with the people of Scotland uh, on economic as well as uh, political matters. Uh, whereas the Scottish Parliament, although it's, it's not perfect, uh, but I think it responds far more readily and far more positively to the values, the needs, the wishes, the aspirations, and the economic priorities uh, of the people of Scotland. And let me just take uh, uh, just a few examples. Radical land reform, absence of tuition fees for university students, care of the elderly, uh, no prescription charges for NHS patients. But of course, the powers of the Scottish Parliament are very limited. Uh, most of the big decisions the big political decisions and the big economic decisions are still taken at Westminster. And I believe that with independence, the Scottish Parliament could do so much more economically and uh, politically. Uh, I say to myself and I say to you as distinguished members of the Scottish Parliament, if the Scottish Parliament can be responsible for important services such as education and the National Health Service, why should it not be responsible for taking decisions on whether or not we should be involved in illegal warfare or whether we should uh, have nuclear weapons? Uh, and similarly, the, on the regulation of financial institutions, if the Scottish Parliament had powers over that, we'd be able to have, a, uh, to my mind, a, a better uh, regime stopping bankers uh, filling their pockets with big fat bonuses while bringing the country to the brink of uh, economic disaster. And if we had powers over tax and national insurance, then we'd be able to introduce a fairer, more progressive system of taxation uh, and, uh, well, a fairer system of benefits too, including the abolition of the iniquitous bedroom tax, which would never have seen the light of day if we'd had uh, complete uh, independence uh, in our parliament. So. Uh, in conclusion, I see independence not as an end in itself. I see it as a means towards building a better Scotland, a more prosperous Scotland, a fairer Scotland, and a Scotland that will play its full part in the international community to help to build a better world. Thank you. Mr Jenkins, do you want to add just anything just at this point? Just a very brief thought, yeah. if I may convene to, to what Dennis has just said. I mean, I, I'm not a politician, but I, I know quite a few. Um, it, it, seems to me, it seems to me that uh, in whichever party, all the politicians I know come into politics to make a difference. Uh, and I think if you imagine 2016 and the first elections to an independent Scottish Parliament, I mean, how exciting for every party in this Parliament, for every politician in this Parliament, that for the first time you'll be able to devise, to propose, and then perhaps to implement a fully coordinated and integrated set of proposals to develop the Scottish economy, to do the kind of things that Dennis has just been talking about, to achieve fairer distribution of wealth, to grow our economy, to make the kind of changes that we all know we'd like to see in Scotland. So I believe that um, there are lots of reasons why uh, Scotland would benefit economically from independence. Uh, we know the Westminster system is not working for Scotland. 
we know we need to address huge issues around uh, inequality of wealth and opportunity. Uh, and I, I firmly believe, and I know we'll get into the detail of this, that the compelling arguments for Scottish independence are nowhere more compelling than they are in the areas to do with the economy. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I have a couple of issues I want to follow up on, and then I'll bring in, bring in some others. Um, maybe I could start off, Dennis Cameron, with yourself. I mean, you, you talk very passionately there about the need to have full independence, uh, to, to extend the powers of Holyrood, and to control uh, the levers of power. Uh, one issue we spent quite a lot of time looking at in uh, this committee is the question of currency. And it's always seemed to me that if you want to have an independent country to have proper control over the levers of power, power to set your interest rates, what you want to have is your own currency, not somebody else's. Would you agree with that? Well, as you may remember, uh, uh, convener, uh, at an earlier stage in this whole debate and before the, the Scottish Government issued its white paper, I expressed uh, a personal view uh, expressing support uh, for uh, the principle of a, a, a Scottish, uh, an independent Scottish currency. But uh, I don't think that my own personal views are of paramount importance in this great debate. Uh, since I made that statement in public, and I do not retract it, but since I made that statement, the Scottish Government has uh, published its white paper and made it clear uh, that their preference would be uh, for a, a sterling currency union. And that, therefore, bearing in mind that the Scottish Government received a mandate from the people of Scotland to have this referendum uh, and to negotiate on the terms in, uh, in the aftermath of a yes result in that referendum, uh, then, as a good Democrat, I accept that the Scottish uh, Government uh, has the democratic right to proceed uh, and uh, to uh, try to get uh, negotiations going regarding uh, a sterling uh, currency union. But you, you believe, uh, as indeed I do, that if we were to be an independent country, we should have our own currency, because that gives us the maximum economic freedom. Why then do you think that the, uh, the Scottish Government in their white paper are not proposing that, if that's the optimum outcome? Is it just because they're not trying to scare the horses in advance of the vote in September? No, I think if you look at the, 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 the commission, which the, the independent commission, which the Scottish Government set up, including some distinguished Nobel laureates who know more, far more than I do about uh, economics, and I think that uh, uh, there are pros and cons in each of these options, and I think that the Commission uh, said in so many words that uh, any of the four options which they put forward would be uh, workable in an independent uh, Scotland. And uh, the Scottish Government has, uh, in its white paper, outlined the reasons why it uh, prefers uh, to have a, a sterling uh, currency union. Uh, it intends uh, pursuing that, despite the opposition that has been expressed uh, by the UK government. Uh, and in my view, in my humble opinion, I think that the UK government would be cut, cutting off its nose to spite its face uh, by uh, not uh, negotiating uh, on that matter, because there would be uh, certain disadvantages to the rest of the UK economy. Uh, not just the transaction costs, but uh, more importantly, the uh, growing trade deficit, which would ar arise as a result of the, the loss of uh, oil and gas revenues. I think, convener, um, courtesy of the Guardian newspaper, we now have a much clearer idea of what the, the UK government's real position is on currency union as opposed to what politicians uh, say in public. There's a point. A point uh, there's a point, um, the point you made in your opening uh, remarks, your opening question, which I'd just like to pick up, which was you, you suggested that it was an absolute prerequisite of being an independent country that you set your own interest rates. And there's an awful lot of countries in Europe would have to go and uh, say, by the way, you realise you're not independent. We'd have to go into Austria and France and Germany and saying, because the European Central Bank determines your interest rates across the Eurozone, you're not really independent. So I'm not quite sure uh, that fully stacks up. One of the interesting things about this debate... Um, is, that, uh, is that there are lots now of economists, and you know, there's a long list of names, some of whom I think probably have given evidence to you, of economists who have no skin in this game, 
uh, who are either have no view on Scottish independence or who are against the notion of Scottish independence, who have nevertheless said the best option for both Scotland and the rest of the UK, if Scotland votes, as I believe we will in September, to be an independent country, it is in the best interest of both countries to have a formal currency union. I think I know certainly Professor uh, Anton Muscatelli said that in evidence of this committee. Recently, of course, uh, the very distinguished uh, Beijing-based uh, economist, uh, Professor Leslie Young, uh, has also said that if Scotland votes for independence, and although he didn't say so in terms, he seemed to indicate that he wasn't personally in favour of that option. But nevertheless, it was in the best interest, very clearly, of both the rest of the UK and Scotland to have a currency union in the event of Scottish independence. He described the publicly declared position of George Osborne as, on rejecting currency union as a subterfuge to frighten Scottish voters, and I think he's pretty close to the mark there. Yes, I seem to remember when Anton Muscatelli came to this uh, committee to give that evidence, he was outnumbered four to one on a panel of esteemed economists who took a different view. And if we're, if we're banding around uh, esteemed economists, uh, the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman has described the white paper's uh, monetary proposals as deeply muddle-headed. But can, can I just ask one more question, because it, it follows up on something that Dennis Kahneman said about the white paper. What is, yes, Scotland's position on the Scottish Government's white paper? Do, do you endorse it? The, the, uh, we, we endorse it insofar as that will be the starting point of negotiations. But, of course, the overriding principle with regard to Yes Scotland is that we believe in the democratic right of the people of Scotland uh, to, de to determine uh, their own destiny. That is what uh, sovereignty in an indep independent Scotland means. Yes Scotland is not a political party. We do not uh, set out a manifesto or anything like that. But we accept uh, that the Scottish Government got the democratic mandate from the people of Scotland to have this referendum, uh, and they therefore have a, a right and a duty, the Scottish Government that is, to set out their proposals in that white paper uh, for what they presumably hope will be not just this, the, the Scottish Government in the interim stage of the negotiations, but when the election comes to the first independent Scottish Parliament in 2016. I dare say this, the present Scottish Government will be hoping that they will continue to be in government, but that uh, remains to be seen. It will be up to uh, each of the, the parties contesting the 2016 first elections to an independent Scottish Parliament. It will be up to each of these parties to set out their stall and uh, to seek the approval of the, the people of Scotland. Just, just in addition to that, um, it's worth saying that there are, there are two types of content in Scotland's future. Uh, and Dennis is absolutely right that the, the stuff that's to do with the initial framework of an independent Scotland, the arrangements that we put in place for an independent Scotland, is, we agree would be the starting point for an independent country. Obviously, the, uh, the White Paper also contains a great deal of content which is related to policies that an SNP government would pursue in an independent Scotland. And those are a matter, quite rightly, for the SNP. And were either of you involved in discussions about the content of the white paper before it was published? Um, not formally, no. We, we have uh, conversations rather than formal discussions, but uh, no, I, I, I personally... With, with whom? With civil servants? With Scottish uh, Well, for medicine? example, I, I chair the advisory board of uh, the Yes Scotland mm. campaign. Uh, and included on that advisory board are representatives of various parties and people like myself who are not members of any party at all, but uh, um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the de Deputy F uh, First Minister, um, um, is a member of our, our advisory board and uh, she attends most of our meetings and uh, we have sometimes have very uh, frank uh, conversations. Okay. Over what, but but what there, were no discussions, there were no discussions with civil servants prior to the no. publication of the White no. Paper? That, that's also true, Mike. No discussions with civil servants right. and no prior sight of okay. the white paper. Okay. And yeah, the final question. So neither of you saw the white paper no. before it was published? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, good morning again, gentlemen. Um, earlier this morning, uh, we had uh, the better together uh, in this morning. Um, I, I think it was actually an advert for uh, a Labour Party political broadcast uh, more than anything else, to be perfectly honest. But uh, I asked them basically at that time was uh, the Prime Minister David Cameron has said that uh, of course Scotland can be a successful independent country. And there's no disputing that, is there, gentlemen? 
Well, there's no disputing it at all, and uh, uh, I believe that the leader of the Scottish uh, Conservatives has said uh, uh, something similar. Indeed, uh, there seems to be almost a, uh, a welcome but rather belated recognition on the part of many of our opponents now that uh, uh, an independent Scotland uh, would be very viable. And in fact, the, the, some of the opponents are actually supportive of yes. I mean, uh, Labour for yes, for instance, and we have Liberal Democrats for yes, and I've even met um, a few uh, Conservatives for yes. I'll, I'll maybe give their names to Mordo later so he can maybe pay them a visit. Um, but it, it's really across all parties and none, isn't it? And, and yourself, um, Blair Jenkins, you're not a member of a political party, but you believe in the, the route and the pathway of, that we're taking towards the referendum for independent Scotland? I absolutely do. I mean, I, I, as you say, I'm not, I'm not, I have no view on, on, on party matters, but uh, I certainly do believe the right future for Scotland is as an independent country. One of the enormously enjoyable uh, things about the Yes campaign, and it's a, a privilege to be in this job, is how many people are involved now very actively who have no connection previously with any form of political activity or any political party. I think what we formed is a very exciting grassroots national movement, which encompasses all political views and people who simply think this is the right thing to do. I think that the benefits to Scotland from this campaign, apart from the yes vote in September, will be, I think, a re-energised and a re-engaged population and a much, much more uh, active uh, and much more interested electorate right around Scotland. There's a lot of people got interested in, uh, in stuff in the last uh, year or two who are, who are not just going to go back to being passive citizens, they're going to be very active citizens including a lot of our young people. And I think we'll all get the benefit of that. Uh, and perhaps I can come to Dennis Canavan on this. Uh, more from your experience as a Westminster parliamentarian and indeed as uh, an MSP here in Holyrood. Um, we, we've just uh, witnessed record investment uh, in Scotland at the moment uh, from a variety of country, uh, companies. We're also seeing extremely healthy exports. We're seeing... Um, a higher employment and lower employment than the rest of the UK. We're seeing uh, an absolutely uh, fantastic and successful apprenticeship programme. Uh, do you put that down to the policies of the Scottish Government? Uh, uh, partly, yes, but I believe that if the Scottish uh, Government, uh, accountable to the Scottish Parliament, had all the the uh, economic and fiscal levers available to it, then it would be able to do so much more to regenerate the, the Scottish economy, to grow the Scottish economy, and to create more jobs. The point is that <clears throat> companies, external companies, that have maybe no political axe to grind, are continuing to invest in Scotland regardless of a referendum. They have the confidence that, regardless of outcomes, that there, there's success is in the horizon. Yes, I, I think that uh, that is a fair comment. That uh, you know, the, particularly with regard to inward in investment, I think that uh, the, 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 there is a, a good story to be told, and uh, many potential investors do not seem to be put off uh, by uh, the prospect of a, of a referendum. And uh, I also recall a, a previous uh, referendum. Uh, uh, in 1997 and the previous one to that, uh, way back in 1979, when there were all sorts of scare stories about potential investors uh, being put off in the event uh, even of a devolved uh, Scottish Parliament. Well, the Scottish Parliament has now been up and running successfully for 15 years, and I think that most of these scare stories are, are seen to be un unfounded. I too remember the referendums that you referred to and I also remember that uh, uh, there were um, promises then of additional powers to Scotland. Um, they weren't really forthcoming at the time, were they not? Well, uh, there was uh, the famous case, of course, of a former Conservative uh, Prime Minister uh, who uh, indicated that uh, in the event of the devolved, the Labour government's proposed devolved uh, parliament or assembly, as it was called, n not coming into existence, and then a future Conservative government uh, would in fact bring forward better proposals uh, for an assembly or devolved parliament. But, uh, well, we all know what happened then. Um, uh, this, and as a result, the Scottish Parliament, with the creation of that Scottish Parliament, was postponed 
uh, for 20 years, and yeah. I think that there was a missed opportunity for the people yeah, and of Scotland. Perhaps, finally. Yeah, okay. Yeah, could I just... Uh, just one point, Deputy Convener, just because uh, it's the best, the most uh, independent and objective um, interpretation I've seen on this point about uh, investment coming into Scotland in the current context was from the Ernst & Young uh, UK Attractiveness Survey last year, where they said the possibility of independence and its potential knock-on impacts on areas such as corporate taxation appear to be having little effect on uh, foreign direct investment decisions. There is certainly no sign of investors being deterred from coming to Scotland. If anything, the reverse appears to be true. So finally, I mean, why do you think then that uh, Better Together seem to be wishing to promote the fact that there that, that would be a threat to Scotland's investment if, if the referendum A were to happen, and we know it's happening, uh, and if we became independent, that we would see companies uh, up sticks and go? Well, I think that's a question you'd be, be better putting to the better together uh, representatives, but I think... I'm not sure they would have answered. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you, if you look at the political situation, I mean, most of the leading lights uh, in Better Together have got a vested uh, interest, a vested political interest in keeping the status quo uh, and keeping the power at Westminster. Could I make just a, perhaps a, a general observation on the, on the question you asked there, which is to say that... Um, I, I think, as a, as a generalisation, because there is so little that you can find fault with and, and so little that's negative about the current and historic data relating to the Scottish economy, I think in order to deter people from voting yes, you have to project all sorts of fanciful and fearful notions into the future, given that the published data is pretty hard to refute. Right, thank you. Okay. Uh, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, to Dennis Canavan, you mentioned in your introductory uh, speech that fairer taxation and welfare services uh, would be one of the benefits if we had an independent Scotland. How would that be funded, and where, you know, how much of that would come from the uh, taxpayers in Scotland? Well, we would have uh, full fiscal autonomy, obviously, and uh, the, the, the total tax take would come from uh, the people uh, living in Scotland or, of course, uh, companies uh, based uh, in Scotland. Um, and uh, that is how our public services uh, would be funded in an independent Scotland. So it's without doubt, then, that there would be increases in taxation for... Everyone. Yeah. It's, not, it's not without doubt. Uh, it would depend on which party actually won the 2016 uh, general election in an independent Scotland and indeed uh, uh, subsequent elections in an independent Scotland. And uh, as I said previously, it would be up to each party, including the Scottish Labour Party, to put out its uh, proposals. Uh, uh, I think I indicated previously that my preferred option would be to see a much fairer, more progressive system of taxation. And speaking personally, that means for me that the rich would pay a bit more, uh, the not so rich would pay less, and the very poor would, would not be uh, paying anything at all. But we've heard from you know the panel this morning and from previous uh, witnesses that there are much fewer higher rate taxpayers in Scotland than there is in the rest of the UK and the tax base itself is, is it about 2.4 billion people who are paying tax 2.4 million, Two and a half million Two, yeah so so there's a much smaller uh, base to start from so surely if we're going to try and better the welfare system and there's got to be increases in tax if we're to balance the books. I, 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 I listened to some of what uh, Alistair Darling said previously, and I think that he indicated that the size is not of paramount uh, importance, that even a relatively small country can bring about a degree of uh, redistribution uh, of wealth. But, of course, we've also got to look at the creation as well as the redistribution of wealth. And... Uh, I have every confidence that in an independent Scotland uh, we would have a government or governments uh, elected that would get a balance between the need to create wealth while at the same time ensuring that that wealth which is created is more equitably dis distributed uh, amongst the people of Scotland. 
And uh, how long do you think it would realistically take to set up a new tax system and all the relevant institutes around that? I think the present Scottish Government has indicated that there would be a transitional stage where they would uh, be, be using uh, basically HMRC, um, or at least in, in part. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, by shortly after, after the first elections to the Scottish Parliament in 2016, we could uh, get things moving fairly quickly. I, I wouldn't like to put a, an exact uh, figure on it, but uh, these are challenges which I'm sure that we're quite capable of uh, responding to. And uh, even the, the, the Kalman proposals, if and when they uh, become a reality, they would require uh, certain changes in the Scottish taxation system. So uh, I don't see that these uh, problems are uh, insurmountable. You know, well, I suppose we can, you know, call them challenges if you like, but it is a huge undertaking to set up a, a new tax system and welfare system. Well, it, 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 <laughs> It's a big challenge, but it's certainly not an insurmountable challenge. I mean, if, a, 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 if, you, if you look at the, the, the poverty that occurred in the, the Republic of Ireland or the Irish Free State when it uh, had to start all of these things off from scratch, and uh, they managed it. And if a, a wee country like that uh, can do it with the poverty that existed in Ireland in the 1920s, heavens above, we, surely in, in Scotland, with their expertise and relative wealth, we could rise to the occasion. So there's likely to be that period. You're saying you could maybe do it within uh, under two years, uh, but in actual fact, it could take a lot, t lot longer than that for that system to actually benefit uh, the people of Scotland. No, I, 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 I don't see it lasting a, a, a long time, but in the transition stage, uh, I, I would expect that uh, HM, HMRC would uh, be uh, accommodating and uh, we, could, we could share uh, some of their expertise and uh, facilities, but that would all be, you know, points for negotiation. The basic principle for which, uh, yes, Scotland stands is that Scotland as a sovereign country should, have, uh, should be independent and uh, that means having a, our own tax system. Yeah, so... I mean, we've heard from ICAS, uh, his report this week, that it would cost at least £700 and, £750 million pounds, uh, to set up the system. Who would bear the cost of all that? Well, obviously, the, 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 the Scottish Exchequer would bear the cost uh, of that. But if in the interim we were sharing resources with HMRC, then there would, there would be, uh, obviously, a, a sharing of the, of the burden. I think to add, just to add a little bit to what Dennis is saying there, um, whatever the challenges, and of course there are always challenges, but whatever the challenges in developing a distinctive Scottish tax system, I think it has to be seen as one of the great opportunities of independence would be to escape from what is very widely regarded as the overcomplicated and un unwieldy and inefficient UK tax system with its very high instances of evasion and avoidance. Uh, the tax system in the UK has not proved uh, an adequate or successful regime for this country. Um, and I think that it should be regarded as one of the great opportunities is to do something rather better and to transform that position. I think on your broader point about taxation, um, I think uh, politicians in this parliament, uh, any party coming to the uh, electorate in 2016 seeking to raise taxes, we'd face the problem that there has been a general loss of public trust in politicians and confidence in politicians, which I have to say is not particularly to do with the politicians in this parliament and is much more to do with the politicians in the Westminster parliament. But uh, one of the jobs of this parliament, once it becomes independent, as it will in a couple of years, will be to rebuild that sense of trust and confidence with the electorate to a point where if a party does have a, a sensible and balanced set of proposals which might include an adjustment to the taxation rate, that people are willing to place their trust and confidence in you. Right. If, you're, if you're to pay, uh, you know, for well, good well, services, well, well, you've well, got question. to pay someone, you know, there's got to be a balance there. Well, so you can't just say, well, it'd be... You know, idealistically, we would like mm. to start from scratch and have a much better tax system. But you've got to be realistic and say, well, well there is a cost to that. Yeah, but we have to get advantage. And no matter which political party would mm. be in, yeah. uh, you've got to balance the books. So if you want to have a better welfare system, 
You've yeah. got to pay for it. Well, we know from all sorts of people, and fairly recently from uh, the, the Bible of the City of London itself, the Financial Times, that an independent Scotland would begin life with a stronger set of public finances than the rest of the UK. And we also have the benefit now of 30 or more years of, uh, of official data to demonstrate that relatively the Scottish economy, Scottish public finances, have been in a better and healthier state uh, than, uh, than those of the UK as a whole. So again, I think we ought not to be afraid of any challenges in this. This is the stuff that independent countries do. The opportunities far outweigh the challenges. Okay. Um, Alison Johnson. Convener. Um, good morning. I think I'll probably address this question to Dennis. Um, you, you said at the, at the beginning this morning that Westminster is increasingly out of touch with the wishes of the Scottish people. Do you think this is in part because the Scottish people didn't vote for the Westminster government and the Westminster government is all too aware that it doesn't actually need the votes of the Scottish people to stay in power? I mean, better together, um, they were absolutely determined this morning that constitutional change isn't the answer to the challenges Scotland faces, that constitutional change isn't required to enable us to maximise the opportunities that Scotland has. Do you think that's a credible view? Well, there's a massive um, democratic deficit uh, in Scotland, and I suppose the most uh, obvious illustration of that at present is that we have a Tory-led coalition government uh, at Westminster, and yet that lead party in the coalition has a magnificent total of one out of 59 uh, uh, parliamentary, Westminster parliamentary constituencies. One out of 59. And yet, under the existing constitution, the Westminster government can impose policies on the people of Scotland, policies which we did not vote for and policies which we do not want. And it is that kind of alienation of people from government which has led to a situation whereby I think Westminster is completely out of touch uh, with the people of Scotland, whereas, as I said previously, the Scottish Parliament, although it's not perfect, <laughs> like every Parliament, is made up of human beings, and human beings sometimes make mistakes. But I think in its 15 years of existence, the Scottish Parliament has shown that it responds uh, far more readily to the democratic will of the people of Scotland. Um, I think I've yet to understand what steps those who maintain that we're better together are going to take to address growing inequality and poverty in Scotland. I mean, certainly the ev evidence suggests uh, you know, there's, there's a complete failure to do so. There's no vision from Better Together as to how they intend to, to bring about the change that's so clearly necessary. What opportunities would a yes vote provide? Well, if I could comment just briefly on the, the, the uh, Better Together uh, statements. Um, they claim that because there's a bigger pool, that that gives more opportunity for the sharing of resources. These, these are the terms that they use, better together, pooling and sharing of resources. But it hasn't worked. I mean, it just hasn't worked because we have now in the UK uh, the fourth most unequal society in the developed world, whereas in Scotland, with us, with the advantages of an independent Scottish Parliament, we would have all the economic levers at our disposal to bring about a fairer uh, distribution of wealth. And I do think that there is a, a will within the, the people of Scotland to accept a fairer, sharer, a, fa a fairer, more sharing uh, society, uh, rather than... Um, uh, what we have uh, at present, where the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider instead of narrower. Can I just add a little bit to that? Um, I think it's worth saying, I mean, you're absolutely right about the levels of inequality. It's worth saying that this is not just a feature of life under the current UK government or of just the recent years of the UK. I mean, the OECD has, has made the point that levels of income inequality in the UK have risen faster than in any other developed country since 1975. So this is not a recent phenomenon in, in the UK. This is a, the, the levels of inequality, the rise of inequality and the loss of opportunity for so many of our people is something that goes back years and years and it's not a phenomenon of, of the last few years. In terms of what um, Scotland could do to address some of these things, I mean, there is a need, I think, to do two things. Clearly, to grow the economy 
and then within that growth to achieve a fairer distribution of wealth and opportunity. And I believe that this Parliament, when it has all of the economic levers at its disposal, will do more to bring in more investment. It's investment that drives growth, and I think uh, there are all sorts of opportunities through uh, devising the right package of incentives to secure more investment, not just by, uh, by, by foreign uh, ventures, foreign enterprises, but also our own indigenous companies. And it's for politicians in this parliament to devise imaginative, uh, creative sets of uh, policies and packages that will, that will do that kind of thing. Um, but you currently, as you know, have very little power uh, in the area of, of redistribution. Uh, because you, you, know, you have no control of the tax system, you have no control over the welfare system. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only by having those levers and by being able to, as I say, offer um, uh, the right kind of measures to attract investment that you can really begin to get to grips with, with some of the long-term endemic problems that we have in the Scottish co economy. Okay, so Mark, we had you had a follow-up. Just uh, as a follow-up to the, the issue of inequality, you highlighted in your submission the issue of the, the geographic dimension of inequality within the UK and the, that the UK hasn't converged in a way that other federal, quasi-federal um, states of the same size ha have. What difference do you think uh, a yes vote would make to that? And how would you go about tackling that? Well, you're right. It's an absolutely valid point that, that, that the regional imbalances in the UK are, are, are huge. Um, and one of the things I would hope that, uh, that any elected independent Scottish government would do in uh, 2016, from 2016 onwards, would be to try and rebalance our economy and to, to revitalise manufacturing in Scotland. I think there are great opportunities there to, uh, to, 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 to grow the Scottish economy and to, um, to make sure that we, we grow the sectors, not just the ones which are of long standing. We know where we've got um, great resources and great success, the oil industry and other areas, but also to develop the opportunities in some of the, the sunrise industries like renewables. Yes, I, I think that part of the problem within the UK is over-centralisation of decision-making, over-centralisation of political decision-making and over-centralisation of uh, economic uh, decision-making. Uh, whereas I think if we had an independent uh, Scotland, uh, that would act as a, a counterbalance to the, the pool of London, as it were, uh, because there is uh, an imbalance uh, in the economies, uh, you know, the e economic uh, spread, as it were, of the, the UK, um, whereby uh, London and the South East seem to get huge economic uh, benefits uh, compared with people, not just in Scotland, but in the, in the, regions, the regions of England. Uh, Richard Baker's got a supplementary question. Mr Jenkins, you mentioned OECD figures, because it seems to me the situation is more complicated than you describe in terms of levels of inequality, because I mean, don't uh, OECD figures show that since the mid-1980s, uh, some of those countries, which those supporting independence often uh, refer to the Nordic countries. Uh, you know, in Sweden and Finland, they've had far uh, higher rising levels of inequality than in the UK. Within the context of being a much more equal society from a starting point. So there's still the spread of, of, of wealth is still uh, much more uh, even, we, we, even in those countries. We're still behind it, the but they've been rising at far levels, uh, at far greater levels in terms of rise of inequality than that's been the case in this country. Yes, but again, relatively speaking, uh, in a context where those are much more uh, fair and, and equal societies, I think the Nordic countries demonstrate very well the fact that you can have strong economic growth and also beneficial societal outcomes. Yes, yes, yes. Can I tell one follow up on that before I bring in Chick Brody. Where are the redistributive measures in the Scottish Government's white paper? The, the, for, for redistribution, if you're talking about policy offers from the, from the SNP, I'm not sure I'm the best person to, to, to ask, ask, answer on behalf of uh, the Scottish National Party. I would have thought the commitment to the living wage, uh, the commitment to uh, keeping, keeping the minimum wage increasing and also to, to the living wages is quite an important part of that. Um, but uh, you know the, the policy aspects of the white paper, I think, are not really for me to comment. No, on. Well, I understand that. But, I mean, both yourself and Mr. Cannon have talked a lot about independence as a route to a more equal society and redistributing income. I I'm interested in this because there's not a lot in the white paper uh, that suggests, for example, increased taxation on higher earners. Uh, that the major tax proposal in the white paper is a reduction in corporation tax, which you might suggest, as, as the earlier panel did, goes in the other direction. I'm not sure what's in there that suggests a more redistributive programme after independence? To be fair, that's a question that should be put to the Scottish Government uh, 
members, Scottish Government well, we'll see them in a couple of weeks so we can ask yeah. them that question. Uh, but the point I would emphasize is this, that with uh, the powers proposed in the White Paper, quite a, as distinct from the policy preferences expressed by the SNP government, but with the powers proposed uh, in the White Paper, that certainly gives huge potential for an independent Scottish government of whatever uh, complexion uh, to bring about uh, a radical redistribution of wealth, whereas at present but, the Scottish Parliament's economic powers are very, very limited. But, Mr Cameron, where is the evidence that people in Scotland have any more interest in voting for higher taxes than anyone else in the UK? Well, we, you know, we've, had, we've had the power to vary taxes in the Scottish Parliament since 1999. Only one party has ever proposed uh, uh, increasing taxes, and that wasn't a great success well, in 1999. That's an interesting question, because if you look at the voting patterns of the people of Scotland over the past half century or more, uh, then most of the parliamentary representatives who have been elected by the people of Scotland uh, have been, well, let's say within the UK political spectrum, they have been left of centre. Uh, and uh, a left of centre uh, government or potential government of Scotland would be more inclined to use the economic levers to bring about greater but, standards but, but, but of no, fairness. With respect, no, nobody stood for the Scottish Parliament election proposing to increase taxation. The only people who did that were the SNP in 1999, which oh. was accepted to be a complete the, failure. The, so the, so the, where is the evidence the, the, that people want higher taxes? The, the, uh, the, the powers uh, at present vested in the Scottish Parliament are, are very limited in terms of bringing about uh, the kind of radical redistribution of wealth that uh, I would like to see. You would, have the, you would need the full range of uh, uh, economic uh, levers uh, to bring about that, that fairer society. Could, can I just a little bit to that, yeah, Kavina, please. since you, since you raised, the, raised the point? I think it goes slightly back to what I said earlier, which is I think if you're going to talk about uh, uh, increase in taxation levels, then you have to do what the Nordic countries have succeeded in doing, which is have a very high level of trust between the electorate and the politicians who serve them. Where people have a high degree of trust, I think they're more willing to believe that uh, what they pay in taxation is going to be wisely invested and, and will provide them with better public services. The tax differentials between UK and, uh, and the Nordic countries are not as high as is sometimes uh, uh, represented. But uh, such differences as there are, and there are differences, I think are based on a different kind of relationship of, of trust uh, and confidence between the people and the politicians. All right, thanks. Right. Um, Chick Brody. Again, uh, perhaps I can help the convener walk through Scottish futures because this dwelling, uh, the, the, the old traditional parties in London on higher taxes, uh, doesn't, of course, look at the consideration and the uh, the elements in the in the paper, which looks at how we develop higher incomes and more revenue and growth in the economy. So, uh, I think high productivity, high wage economy is. Is, is quite, runs, the thread runs quite clearly through the Scottish Futures uh, paper. Just on high wages, I wonder uh, if I may ask uh, Dennis particularly, uh, in a conversation or question I had with, to, to, to Alistair Darling this morning about his sharing of Christmas cake with Fred Goodwin and why didn't he react sooner? <laughs> That's Italian Christmas cake. <laughs> <coughs> Because I don't have to go through Scottish Futures now, also I've got to go through uh, Mary Berry's uh, cookbook. <laughs> uh, in, in the 2nd of May, on 2nd of May 2012, Mervyn King, the Bank of England governor, said that action during Arts that Darling's tenure as Chancellor had been too late and that bold action in October 2008 could have happened sooner. I wonder, and having been uh, involved in, in politics in Westminster, and I also well, I worked in the city for a while. Can you give me an illustration of what you think the relationship is between the Westminster government and the City of London? Well, I think that even Alistair Darling hinted in his earlier remarks that in retrospect um, he, he and uh, other government ministers adopted too light a touch on financial regulation. And as a result, uh, the City of London uh, was able to um, just do what they did, and uh, as a result, um, get the, the country was on the, the brink of e economic uh, disaster. It's all very well being wise after the event, uh, but uh, I would hope that, uh, as I indicated earlier, that uh, an independent uh, Scottish government would learn lessons from the past 
and we would have a better uh, system of uh, financial uh, regulation of banks and other financial uh, institutions, uh, to, for example, stopping the, the culture of bonuses, uh, stopping or at least uh, um, having a, a better system of monitoring uh, potential uh, takeovers. Um, I think that uh, uh, that kind of thing, as well as um, just stop encouraging the whole culture of debt, which seem to uh, be bringing problems for many businesses and uh, many individuals. And, uh, thank you for that. I wonder that, again, Alice Darling wrote that he was responsible for the architecture of the UK financial regulation. We just had the bank, the government of the Bank of England uh, caution uh, the, the government about what some of us might call a housing bubble and the impact that that might have. Uh, I just wonder if you have any comment that we don't want to destroy the future by just looking at the present, but the present looks pretty precarious uh, and we seem to be in another uh, impending financial, uh, not crisis, but uh, problem. Uh, isn't it the case that with fundamental regulation and proper regulation and meaningful application of regulation, that uh, the banking regime under an independent Scotland wheel would be a lot uh, uh, stricter? I think it probably would be. I mean, it's always difficult to see with absolute, absolute certainty what would happen in a particular situation. Uh, but I think that uh, the, there is a feeling uh, uh, within Scotland uh, that uh, the people down at Westminster mishandled the economy. Uh, and uh, lessons have been learned, and uh, I think that there is a, a con consensus within Scotland um, that uh, there should be a better regulation of banks and financial institutions. Jenkins? Well, I would agree with that. I mean, um, there's no doubt that, uh, the, that the failings of politicians were partly responsible for the, the, the financial crisis of some years ago. Um, the primary responsibility lies with the behaviour of the banks and with the weak governance that was in place at the banks. Um, but it, it ripples through the entire system so that the credit ratings agencies had a part in it, the, the regulators certainly had a part in it, and politicians uh, had a part in it. Um, I think it's good that the, the people who were in charge politically at the time should acknowledge uh, some of the blame. Um, it, it, it seemed for some years that the people who were in charge wished to take credit for having launched some of the lifeboats. Um, but weren't quite so willing to take responsibility for the fact that they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't just on the bridge, they were at the wheel at the point when we, we did uh, uh, hit the rocks. So I think it's encouraging if there's a recognition that there were political failures, not just in, in the UK, but in other countries as well. Thank you. And one, one last question, Lamy. Um, again, referring to uh, uh, Mr Darling, who was here earlier. When he was Chancellor in uh, 2008, and, head of, and he's now head of the Better Together campaign, he cut corporation tax uh, further beyond what Gordon Brown had done when he was Chancellor, from 30% to 28%, stating our goal is and will continue to be to maintain the most competitive corporation tax of any major economy. We have the lowest corporation tax rate in the G7. A competitive and simplified tax regime is essential. Now, if we want to achieve a high wage, high productivity economy, that might be one vehicle. Do you think he's changed his mind, or do you think he was right then, or wrong now? I think um, on corporation tax, you, when, you, when, you, when you implement a cut in corporation tax, and, and as you're right, you're right, the Labour government did that. Uh, I know it's a policy proposal that's in the white paper uh, on behalf of the Scottish National Party. You, you don't just look at corporation tax in isolation. Um, so you, obviously you hope that a, a reduction in corporation tax will encourage investment, uh, will encourage the, the growth of the assets of your economy. But as you say, you also, you also have other benefits. You feel the benefits in other parts of the economy. You, you'd hope that your, your revenue from income tax would increase on the back of the investment that the, the lower corporation tax brought about. Um, you'd benefit in indirect taxation uh, expenditure as well. So the, the, the receipts that any Treasury would get from a cut in corporation tax should not just be looked in, in isolation at that tax on its own, but at the benefits throughout the economy. It will be up to political parties. I think uh, in the first election to an independent Scottish Parliament in 2016 to set out the, the fully integrated set of proposals that they wish to make in the area of taxation 
to see to what extent they achieve those twin goals of economic growth, but also a, a fairer re redistribution of wealth and opportunity. Mm. Okay, so I, uh, I must say that, uh, you know, speaking personally, I'm not an enthusiastic uh, cutter of corporation tax uh, uh, for the sake of uh, handing back uh, more money to big uh, corporations. I, 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 would, I would have to be convinced that there are uh, economic benefits from any cut in corporation tax, uh, particularly uh, more job opportunities uh, for, for people. Uh, but um, I think it was Gordon Brown, actually, not Alistair Darling, who first introduced uh, no, in, right. in the Labour government. Gordon Brown got it first and then Darling pulled on. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, Gordon, uh, Gordon Brown did, in fact, uh, reduce uh, uh, corporation tax, and I, I'm therefore a bit, a bit surprised by the utter hostility which I now hear coming from some uh, uh, Labour people saying that uh, um, any cut in corporation tax is a, a very a evil thing in itself. Um, as I say, I, I would have to be convinced about other, if there are other economic uh, uh, benefits, uh, uh, particularly with regard to, to employment opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, convener. Um, you may have heard me asking uh, Mr Darling this morning about uh, what was on the table in terms of more powers for Scotland in the event of a no vote. And um, I wonder if you agree with me that this seems to be a kind of uh, bribe of jam tomorrow uh, if, if from UK politicians of the electorate do what they tell them. Um, it seems to be pretty watery, thin kind of jam to me, but, you know, irrespective of what exactly the percentage in terms of more tax powers and so on may be, do you feel what's being offered from the Lib Dems and the Labour Party, we well, haven't heard from the Tories yet, but do you feel that will make any real difference to um, uh, Scotland in terms of being able to deal with some of the big problems and challenges we've heard about? or indeed take advantage of any of the opportunities that we would have with independence? Well, of course, there's no way in which uh, any of the, the Westminster-based parties can guarantee uh, more powers. They seem to differ. You know, if you look at the, the, the three major Westminster uh, parties, the, the Tory party has still to come out with, I think it's Lord Strathclyde, who's currently looking at the matter, and... Uh, um, uh, he will no doubt be coming out with some statement uh, uh, fairly soon, but we'll, we'll have to see that before we we'll pass judgment on it. Uh, the, the Lib Dems have uh, come out with something. The, 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 the Labour Party, the Scottish Labour Party, has uh, come out with uh, their proposals. Uh, but there is no consensus amongst these three uh, Westminster uh, parties as to what uh, the exact uh, proposals they, they would have regarding additional powers uh, for, for the Scottish Parliament. And I, I mean, I'm a bit suspicious because at the time uh, when the referendum was first mooted, there was a suggestion, and I think that the Scottish Government, the present Scottish Government, was fairly receptive to the suggestion of having an, an additional question about Devil Max, I think they called it, although it was never clearly defined what Devil Max means. But the Unionist parties, anyway, ruled out uh, any additional question on Devil Max uh, uh, in the referendum. Um, and as a result, uh, we have uh, an element of uncertainty about what their proposals uh, are, uh, and also, can they deliver? I mean, I think if people are seriously wanting more powers for the Scottish Parliament, the only guarantee of getting more powers would be to vote yes in this year's referendum, because uh, heaven knows what will happen in any subsequent general election uh, at uh, Westminster. Uh, and, of course, there is this basic point that uh, I think it was Enoch Powell who said that a power devolved is power retained, uh, and ultimately, sovereignty under the existing constitution, sovereignty is based at Westminster. The Westminster Parliament could, if it wanted, abolish your Parliament, this Scottish Parliament, uh, completely. 
um, that this Scottish Parliament at present is a, a creature of the Westminster Parliament, and that, to my mind, underlines the basic democratic deficit which exists in Scotland at present. Well, yeah. well, just I mean, very briefly, on, on, on the remit of this committee, which is the, the economy, uh, it, would, it would just seem to me that there's, there are no, there's no set of proposals from any of the anti-independence parties that would give this parliament control over all the potential uh, tax sources and tax revenues that an independent nation would have, nor indeed control over, uh, over the crucial area of welfare and social protection. Uh, and I think in the absence of those things, you, you're talking of something that's very far short of what Scotland needs. Would you agree with me then that really what um, the, 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 a, a very exciting opportunity for Scotland is that with full economic powers to shape economic and industrial policy and build the kind of high wage economy yeah. that we've talked about, that that's the real prize, the real opportunity in economic terms um, and, and that that in itself would result in a higher tax take actually without raising levels of taxation, even if we're you know, continued with similar levels, building that high-wage, fairer economy wouldn't itself give rise to higher tax. I agree that uh, it's not simply the case that uh, you're dependent on increasing the tax rates in order to get a bigger amount of revenue in through the tax take. That if you have more economic growth, more people in employment, then obviously even with the existing tax rates, you would have a, a, a larger... Uh, amount uh, of tax uh, revenue and, and therefore be able to afford a, a higher rate of uh, public expenditure. So the, the previous debate about um, you know, the so-called Scandinavian model or what happens in certain Scandinavian countries that you must have uh, punitive levels of taxation, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that you've, if you have sufficient economic growth then you'd be able to uh, get more uh, income tax and more corporation tax too and, and other company taxation income in order to pay for uh, public services. And, and do you feel there's an opportunity in terms of um, the, the white paper commitment to increasing childcare to a proper level, both in terms of uh, reducing the gender inequality, but also in terms of a, an economic opportunity to create jobs and to, in, by increasing participation in the workforce? Of course, yes. Childcare and uh, preschool education are very important. Uh, principally, I would argue for for uh, um, ed educational opportunity for, for for children, but also the economic benefits uh, for uh, women who, who want to get into the workplace or return to to the workplace uh, before their children start school. Just to add briefly to that, I think um, I, I said earlier that um, yes, Scotland didn't necessarily take a view on on the policy aspects of of Scotland's future. I have to say of all the, the many people I talk to within the broad yes movement and the different political traditions they represent, I think I've found universal welcome for the proposals on, on childcare, for the proposals on availability of, of free and universal childcare. For the very reasons Dennis mentions, we, we have a key strategic need to grow the, the tax base, to grow the, the, the working population, to increase participation in the labour force. And this looks like one of the, the best ways of doing that. And I, I think it has very broad support. Final question, convener, just a short one. Do you agree that in the kind of zero-sum game that the Scottish Government uh, has to work with at the moment on a fixed budget, that it's impossible to make these kind of step changes uh, policies, game-changing policies, because increasing expenditure significantly, for instance, in childcare, implies taking it away from somewhere else that might be you know, very difficult to do under current circumstances. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, I, I remember uh, speaking about this in the Scottish Parliament when it was uh, first set up and, and indeed uh, during previous debates in the Co Scottish Constitutional uh, Convention, which led to the creation of the Scottish Parliament, uh, I thought at the time uh, that one of the biggest weaknesses in the proposed Scottish Parliament at that time was that it was going to be completely dependent upon another parliament, i.e. the Westminster Parliament, for every penny that it spends. And as a result, although there are those who argue, as Murdo would, uh, that, uh, that there are taxation powers which have n never as yet been used, the fact of the matter is that the, 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 the budget of the Scottish Parliament um, is uh, almost entirely uh, from the block grant. 
And so if John Swinney or any other finance minister uh, wanted to spend more money, say, on education, he'd have to look around somewhere uh, in order to cut uh, something else, uh, because it's a fixed sum of money that he has to, to deal with. And this leads to very uh, difficult uh, choices if you're going to increase uh, investment in education. Are you, for example, going to cut investment in the National Health Service? I mean, that's a, a very unhappy choice facing any finance minister, whereas if you've got all the fiscal lever levers uh, at your disposal, uh, then you can broaden your choices. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Richard Baker. That the comments which were made around a zero-sum game, because it seems to me that with the, the white paper and indeed other others who, who are arguing for uh, an independent Scotland, they're looking to play a zero-sum zero game as well, saying that there will be more generous provision on, on welfare, more generous provision uh, on pensions, more generous provision in a whole range of areas, and yet not saying how these things will be paid for. Uh, we, we come back to the point about taxation levels. There's no detail about where taxation levels will be, will they be up, will they be down, or whatever. I mean, do you not think it would be more honest if those supporting uh, uh, independence said how all these different areas will be paid for. And indeed, if they don't do that, then that case is lacking credibility. I think, um, I think you're confusing 2014 with 2016. Um, it's for parties in their manifestos in 2016 to say exactly what they propose in terms of the public services that they would like to see in place and, and how exactly they propose to fund these. But the, the, the general proposition, which I think is one that's broadly supported across the independence movement, is that an independent Scotland is likely to place a higher value on having good and widely available public services than we think has been the, the general approach taken by, by the UK in recent years. Um, the preferred method for funding that is what we've been discussing in the last several minutes, which is that you, you, you grow the Scottish economy. Um, I think the Scottish economy, left to its own devices, we'd have a, a, a far better uh, idea of what will work here economically and create a far more balanced economy and use all sorts of uh, incentives and levers, both to, both, both to attract that, that investment we talked about from abroad, which we do well in, but we could, we could do better, but also to do things like improving our business startup rate, which we, I think we would all would agree that um, we, we, need, we need to have more uh, innovation, uh, more entrepreneurial society. Uh, I would personally, when I'm looking at all your manifestos in 2016, uh, I would be looking to see what exactly you propose in terms of, uh, of incentivising people to, to start their own businesses. There was some recent data in the American economy which suggested that most of the new jobs being created there are coming from, not from existing businesses expanding their workforce, but from new ventures coming into existence. So let's start bringing some new ventures into existence. But the Institute of Fiscal Studies and others and independent uh, experts looking at our economy haven't said that any government of whatever political uh, population which comes in will have you know, in, in a, if it, Scotland was to be independent, we'd have, you know, great extra resources with a growing economy to spend and all these different pledges which have been made by various parties supporting independence. They said that further austerity will be required. In fact, more difficult choices made over taxation or spending, either increased taxes or cut spending. Why should your analysis be believed rather than those of a, a independent uh, economists and economic uh, organisations like the IFS? Well, what, one of the things we know about economists is that they, they seldom agree with one another, and I think one thing they all do agree on is that their forecasting is, is, is seldom, if ever, if ever accurate. Now, that's true of other uh, professions as well. I don't just wish to uh, put that uh, against what economists have to say. But typically, predictive models that economists put forward deal with a certain number of variables. They look at a certain number of variables, and, and that, for the purposes of international comparison, you're looking to, to compare a finite set of things. What I don't think any of the forward projections for the Scottish economy take into account, and any of the, the, the forward-looking work that's been done take into account, is I think, the, if I can put it this way, is one of the things I strongly believe, the far greater energy that will run through Scottish life, through Scottish society, and through Scottish economy as an independent country, the determination to make this work. Uh, now, how you measure uh, that or predict that in terms of what it does to productivity, what it does to economic activity, is, is hard to do, which is why it's not factored into those uh, economic models. But I think, just to mention three things, I think that greater determination to succeed, I think the greater the raising of Scotland's international profile, and I think the enormous amount of goodwill that there would be towards Scotland as a new independent nation, all provide us with a, a, an enormously encouraging place from which to start. It's, it, it wasn't me who said this originally, but it's something I, I, would, I would endorse. 
it is hard to think of any other, in fact, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be keen to have an example cited, it is hard to think of any country that's become independent in the last 100 years which would be doing so in a more benevolent, uh, a, a, a more um, you know, attractive-looking set of circumstances than, than will be the case for Scotland. Can, can I just uh, add, convenient? No, that it, it won't be the Institute of Fiscal Studies that will be running the Scottish economy in an independent uh, Scotland it will be the Scottish Government accountable to the Scottish Parliament. And uh, I, I can understand Westminster uh, MPs saying, you know, we want to retain power at Westminster, that is our power base, etc. But I find it very difficult to understand uh, people who are members of the Scottish Parliament who, when you say to them, do you want to grow the, 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 the Scottish economy? Yes. Do you want to create more jobs? Yes. Do you want to eliminate child poverty? Yes. But then when you ask them, do you want the tools to do the job? They seem to be saying, no, we'll just leave that to the guys at Westminster. I mean, there's a, there seems to be a lack of confidence on the part of some members of the Scottish Parliament. I would hope that collectively there would be uh, more confidence uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Scottish Parliament and that people who perhaps are inclined to, to vote no uh, would, in the fullness of time, see that the, the people of Scotland and, and their elected representatives uh, uh, can form a good team to run the this, this Scottish body politic and the Scottish economy. And this is my final question, Karina. But, Ms. Conrad, I hope you also uh, uh, respect the fact that there are those of us who simply believe we benefit financially and fiscally through being part of the United Kingdom. We have more money to spend on public services by being part of the United Kingdom, and that we think the relevance of uh, having a separate country which would not be beneficial to public service and public service investment. For example, I take your point on corporation tax. Now, I rather think you and I are agreed on uh, policies towards corporation tax, but that concern has been expressed, for example, on a race to the bottom on corporation tax. One country cuts corporation tax, another will follow to be more uh, attractive to business investment. Business wins out. Uh, and what loses out is investment in the public sector. Don't you think that is a perfectly coherent economic argument, uh, another argument about why we are better working together uh, within the, the nations on this island? Well, if you look at the, 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 the European Union, there are still various rates of personal taxation and various rates of company uh, taxation. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily lead to a, a race uh, to the bottom. I mean, it's up to each individual country within the European Union to take into account its own economic circumstances, its own economic uh, priorities, uh, and implement uh, an econ economic policy which is best suited to the needs of that uh, member state within the, the European Union. So that uh, um, the, the most people, uh, and certainly the, the view expressed in the white, white paper, is that uh, uh, Scotland wants to be a, mem a continuing member of the European Union. And it's not as if we're going to be cutting ourselves off completely uh, from our friends and neighbours uh, in uh, uh, England and, and Wales. That uh, uh, I would hope that there would still be a, a social partnership, uh, an economic partnership, but the present political partnership is, quite frankly, putting Scotland in a straitjacket whereby if we want to move in a particular direction, we find that our nearest big neighbour is calling a veto on what we can do. And that, again, uh, emphasises the, 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 uh, the democratic uh, deficit uh, in uh, Scottish political and economic decision making. Um, Mark Virgin. Uh, when the other side in this talk about the cost of setting up new institutions or, or transitions, they always seem to me to give the impression of Scotland being this desolate moorland with, how with wolves howling in the distance, as if there's nothing actually happening here at the moment. On independence, Danny Alexander, when he came before this committee uh, some time ago now, accepted the principle of Scotland inheriting a share of our asset, of, of the UK's assets, the share that we'd contributed to. So how significant do you think that will be for the economics of, an, uh, of transition and how much of a, an opportunity is that for Scotland when hopefully uh, we become a newly independent nation? Are you thinking primarily there of, of um, things like Bank of England and the currency or other things as well? 
you name it, I believe it's 1.3 um, trillion in assets. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly take the view, I, I, you know, I think as, as do many others, that um, at the point at which Scotland becomes independent, there has to be an equitable distribution of, of assets and liabilities. And, uh, and that, that's the basis, I'm sure, on which those, those negotiations would be conducted. Um, but you're right, large parts of the infrastructure of an independent nation already exist in Scotland. Uh, you know, we have, we have two uh, successfully operating uh, pensions administration centres, for example. Um, you know, there's a, a rather regrettable and I'm sure reg uh, regretted uh, um, list of institutions produced, I think, by uh, either UK government or Better Together, Cameron, which that would have to be set up from scratch in independent Scotland. And as I recall, a very large number of the institutions on the list turned out to be things we already had. So I don't, I don't myself believe, I would not pretend to you or to anyone else that, that, that there will not be a lot of hard work involved in Scotland becoming an independent country. It's important that people in Scotland know there will be a lot of hard work uh, in, in, in setting up an independent country. But what I think they also will know and believe when it comes to September is that the hard work will be worth it, is that what we can achieve as an independent country is going to be, is going to be worth the fact that we're going to have to all put our shoulders to the wheel and be determined to make it work. Mm. There is also, of course, the question of foreign-based uh, assets, including our uh, embassies abroad. I say our embassies because they are at present uh, British or UK uh, embassies, but uh, Scotland would presumably be entitled to uh, a share of these uh, buildings and other assets and resources. It may very well be that in certain, cir certain circumstances we may want to continue uh, sharing our diplomatic uh, presence uh, with uh, our friends south of the border or with some other European Union country. Uh, but this is very relevant to uh, e the economy of Scotland too, that uh, very often um, the diplomatic presence uh, or consular presence um, involves uh, not just simply looking after people's social needs, but also trying to promote the economy uh, of a country. Uh, and uh, I am told uh, by some Scottish business people that um, sometimes um, in the promotion of Scotland overseas, there isn't enough emphasis uh, as there should be. Uh, in terms of that, because, the, again, the priorities of the UK as a whole in terms of international promotion may be quite different uh, from the priorities uh, of the Scottish business sector. So I would hope that uh, uh, we could continue to get a share of assets, possibly even in certain circumstances uh, sharing our presence in some of these uh, embassies, but our policy in terms of international promotion of Scotland uh, overseas would be something that would reflect more the needs and priorities of Scottish business. And just as a, a follow-up, based on <coughs> what you were referring to there, how much of an opportunity do you think there is for the internationalisation of Scottish business so that, yes, we continue to export to our major neighbouring market, but we also increase our exports globally and, and turn our face to the world? Oh, I, you definitely, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. I think there is a great opportunity there. We, we know we're already a much more of an export-based economy than the rest of the UK, and I think that's something all of us would be determined to improve upon um, when, uh, when Scotland becomes independent. I think in, in terms of the, the world overall, I think 30% of world GDP involves exports, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's a crucial part of running your economy that you don't just satisfy domestic market, you satisfy international markets. I think the Scottish brand is a very, very good one, um, I think, as I, say, I said earlier, I, I think there's an enormous amount of interest in Scotland and goodwill towards Scotland. And if we have the right products at the right price, uh, I think there's every opportunity to internationalise our, our economy. And uh, are you worried that the UK currently has a, a deficit of imports over exports of, I think, £72 billion, whereas Spice have told us that Scotland would be at or near surplus in uh, our trade balance? Well, we know, I mean, we, as, we say, we, as I said earlier, we can go back over a number of years and we know that um, while both countries have for most years run uh, uh, fiscal deficits, that the position in Scotland relatively has been better than the rest of the UK. And we can, we can see that evidence stitching back not just five years, but 30 years that overall we've, we've, uh, we're in a much stronger position. And uh, as I understand that the projected deficit for the first year of an independent Scotland would look likely to be within the range that, for instance, the, the, the European Central Bank regards as a balanced budget. So um, I, I think we have every reason to be confident. Okay. And lastly, Joan McAlpin. Mr. Convener, 
The Westminster Unionist parties are all committed to the renewal of Trident um, at the cost of £100 billion, I, I believe. What are the economic uh, implications for Scotland in that decision, um, in your view, in the event of a no-vote? Well, I, I think um, I would be very confident in saying that that, that was money that uh, people in Scotland would regard as being, as being not well spent, as being spent on something that not, is not only unnecessary, but is highly undesirable and against, uh, against the wishes of, of, of people here. Uh, I believe, I'm, I'm sure I'm right in saying it, with Tony Blair in his, in his memoirs, who said that uh, the only reason that the UK would not um, dispose of Trident, get rid of the Trident system, was because it had become an important status symbol for the country, uh, as opposed to having any defence rationale any longer. So among the many savings an independent Scotland would make, um, I and I think most uh, YES supporters would say that the opportunity to stop wasting so much money on a completely unnecessary and immoral weapon system is, is one of the, the strongest arguments for independence. Yes, I, I have found uh, going around the, the country uh, campaigning for a YES vote uh, that there is overwhelming support for the uh, removal uh, of Trident and uh, opinion poll after opinion poll seems to indicate that that is the, the, the majority view of the, the people of Scotland. Um, even people who supported the, the retention of uh, uh, Trident uh, uh, during the, the Cold War um, have now come to the conclusion that it is uh, rather like a, a very expensive uh, white elephant. It is unusable. We saw that at the time of the Iraq war, I suppose. I mean, uh, uh, much as everybody disapproved of the Saddam Hussein uh, regime, uh, then nobody would dream of uh, using uh, a trident nuclear weapon uh, in such circumstances because of the, the massive uh, loss of innocent uh, civilian life which would ensue as a result of uh, the use of such a weapon. So it is uh, militarily uh, unusable. Uh, there are strong uh, moral uh, arguments uh, uh, against it due to the uh, almost certain loss of uh, civilian life if it was uh, ever used. Uh, but there's also economic arguments against it too because uh, the, um, the money which is spent uh, on, on a Trident nuclear weapon uh, could be used uh, for things like education or national health service or job opportunities or, or whatever. So for all of these reasons, I think there would be great um, economic as well as uh, social benefits from the removal of Trident. On um, the subject of fear, um, the term project fear is uh, what we understand. The No campaign calls itself internally. And uh, since the beginning of the year, when the Chancellor made his announcement about currency, um, Project Fear have also talked about a dam buster strategy of... Well, yes, I'm the, coming to, the, to that, Convener. To the economic, I'm coming to that, yes, economic absolutely. Future, please. Um, yes. A dam buster strategy approach um, uh, to their campaigning, which uh, some have criticised as very negative. What do you think the implications of that are on Scotland's economy and also on your own campaign? Well, it certainly doesn't put a good image of Scotland uh, across. I, I just hope that there are not too many potential inward investors listening to all these prophets of doom and gloom uh, who are in the, in the no camp. Uh, you know, I'd, and I, I would hope that they, w they will see the error of their ways. We, we are too busy in our campaign projecting positive things. You know, we, d we don't scaremonger. I prefer to call our, our campaign Project Hope rather than Project Fear or pro Project of Optimism rather than uh, Project of uh, Pessimism. And uh, I think that that message is getting through. And uh, uh, I would hope that... Uh, uh, even some of our opponents would uh, realise that uh, there is a danger if they are downplaying uh, the success uh, of Scotland, then this could have a detrimental uh, effect uh, uh, on Scotland's economy and other aspects of uh, Scottish life. And we keep on being told that we're all working for Scotland's best interests, although there may be different concepts of what uh, Scotland's best interests are. Uh, but I do think that we've got to be 
careful in the language that we're using because uh, at present um, the eyes of the world are on Scotland and if we're projecting Scotland as a, a place of no hope and uh, all these negative things then uh, you know it could have a, a detrimental effect on uh, uh, Scotland's economy. I just think on, on the precise example you gave, which was the, the announcement in relation to um, the currency back in, in February, um, as I said earlier, I believe, we, no, we now know from The Guardian this was a campaigning position. It wasn't um, something that the, the, the UK government had reached, a decision they'd reached after some prolonged period of internal uh, discussion. Uh, the two, Alistair and Andrew, were in charge. We did what we were told. We did what they said. Um, I, think, I think the fact that um, it was made so clear by a newspaper which is, which is not in any way well predisposed towards independence, that, um, that of course there would be a currency union, said the Minister, who is a central part of the No campaign and would have, I think they said, a key role in negotiations following a yes vote. So no, we know this was coming from the heart of government, of course there would be a currency union, the only reason we said anything else was for campaign purposes. Um, I think that tells you a great deal about the, the nature of the campaign that, uh, that's currently being waged. And on that particular subject, I raised that report with Alistair Darling this morning, and if, um, he, he um, denied um, that it was it, it was uh, him that was in charge. However, if he refused to he refused to say whether he had discussed matters of independence in the currency union with his friend Nick McPherson, who of course was very involved in that particular announcement. Uh, would it concern you if um, Alistair Darling had been discussing? these matters with Nick McPherson? I'm not sure I could comment in, in, in great deal on that because, as, as he said, I think, you know, you, I do accept there are friendships which go beyond necessarily the roles people happen to be in any, at any given time. What I think I would say is that um, the journalist who, who wrote the story, um, Nick Watt, who wrote The Guardian story, seems to be very well connected at the Treasury because he actually broke the news that George Osborne was going to formally rule out the currency union. So I'm sure he'll be paying very close attention to what Alistair Darling said this morning. And, and checking it with his sources uh, as to what the origins were of the sudden change of mind at the Treasury to stop saying a currency union was merely unlikely and to start saying that they were formally ruling it out. Sometimes political collaboration can take place as a result of informal conversations between friends or former friends or uh, civil servants and politicians, etc. Uh, but... Um, I am very suspicious about the timing of all this, and it seemed to me rather uh, coincidental, or too, too much to say simply coincidence, that uh, the three spokespersons for the three major parties at Westminster suddenly came together and said, we are ruling out uh, completely uh, any currency uh, union. Um, and it remains to be seen whether they will stick by that unanimity when they have to face up to the uh, real politic and the uh, real economic in the immediate aftermath of a yes vote. Uh, Richard Baker, I think, has a supplementary. The help, uh, Ms. McAlpine, because... No, can we have a question, please? Oh, is that a question? Indeed, well, would well, Mr Jenkins recognise that, indeed, the, the, the campaign which has been brought forward, and, indeed, Mr Canavan, uh, on behalf of Better Together is indeed for more powers for this Parliament. And no one has ever suggested this Parliament should be abolished. Indeed, it could be argued that that's scaremongering, if anybody's scaremongering in this campaign. I stated a simple fact that this Parliament, this Scottish Parliament, is a creature of Westminster. And it is possible for Westminster to abolish this Scottish Parliament by an act of the Westminster Parliament, because sovereignty is vested in Westminster. That is, that is a, a legal fact. That is not a, a, an, an opinion. I'm not saying that it is therefore likely that that would, would happen. Uh, but on the other point about uh, the more powers uh, for the Scottish Parliament, um, I referred briefly earlier to the lack of a guarantee that these powers can be delivered. Uh, the only r real guarantee that people have of getting more powers for the Scottish Parliament is by voting yes in the, in the, in the referendum. I, th I think just very briefly to add to that, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I don't doubt the sincerity of lots of people uh, in, in various political parties who, who wish to see a form of enhanced devolution for Scotland. That's a perfectly reasonable position. What I do really doubt is the appetite at Westminster for pursuing that with any enthusiasm. Uh, 
uh, after the referendum in September. And I think whatever uh, Scottish politicians or politicians in this parliament may, may wish and hope for what might follow a no vote, uh, which I don't think will happen, luckily, uh, I think the, you'll find that the, the resistance uh, at Westminster to adding anything to the powers of this parliament will be very considerable and hard to overcome. Given these powers being pledged prior to the no vote rather than afterwards, then I think uh, uh, that takes on board Mr Jenkins' concerns. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there, Mr, Mr. Convener. Okay. All right, okay. Right, okay, thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much uh, for coming along this morning and answering our question, helping us with our inquiry, uh, which shall now suspend very uh, briefly and go into private session. Thank you.